Alright, what's up everybody? Welcome to another episode of Talking Christianity Apologetics. My name is Josh Gibbs. Today we have got a fun episode for you. I think this is uh, uh, going to be a really good conversation to have. I know I had mentioned this in one of my posts earlier regarding the topic on the dating of the book of Revelation, that if you'd ever seen the Mark Hitchcock versus Hank Hanegraaff debate, uh, I think uh, this is right up the alley um, regarding the line of conversation as it relates to kind of eschatological positions and the impact that this conversation has on, uh, I, you know, such a wide variety of topics. So I, I hope that you're able to engage with us, stick with us throughout the whole debate. Uh, we've got James Rockford and Dr. Dean Furlong uh, who are going to debate the early versus the late dating of the book of Revelation. So I think it's going to be worth your time. Stay with us, and we're going to get back into introduction so you can meet these guys and get kind of the... the uh, the format for what the dialogue is going to look like and uh, how you can join and be a part of the conversation as well. So, Make sure today that you leave this place knowing that you are saved to the glory of God. Thanks. That one I'm going to choose. If you believe that, friends, you don't know the gospel. The point is that the wonder of the cross is that no one gets injustice. If you, if you end up under the wrath of God, it is because you've read teach. I think the Bible does teach that God desires the salvation of all men. He has provided uh, for uh, the, the salvation of all men. And therefore, anyone who, who ends up under the wrath of God, it is because they have rejected his provision for them. And they are justly punished for their sins. The question that for, seeks to provide an answer to this question, for whose sins did Jesus die? The extent of the atonement asks the question, for whose sins did Jesus die? There are only two answers, two possible answers to that question. Either Jesus died for the sins of some people, or Jesus died for the sins of all people. All right, so once again, welcome to another episode of Talking Christianity. Thanks for joining us, guys. Um, I'm going to add our guests in and give introductions and then kind of go through the format for what our conversation is going to look like and go from there. But let's get Dean in here, Dr. Dean Furlong, and James in here, James Rockford. These are going to be our two guests for today's conversation. So, Dean, I've got you in the center. James, you're on the right. Hopefully you guys can all see each other pretty well. But uh, thank you for being willing to work together to get this debate scheduled and formatted. I've got to tell you guys, this has been by far the easiest uh, debate that I've been a I've had to kind of organize. It's been super easy. Um, the, the structure was super easy to agree on. The thesis was super easy to agree on. Um, Dean, Dean and I had been working together on, hey, who can we get um, to uh, kind of find as a formal opponent, opponent to the early dating, being that Dean has done his dissertation on the subject and interacted with a lot of Mark, Mark Hitchcock's work and other others, but um, and it came to James Rockford, and, and James was immediately like, "Hand up, yeah, let's do it. Let's make this thing happen. This is a good conversation to have." So, both of you guys, thank you for being willing to come on to the podcast and to make this thing happen. So, yeah, glad to be here. Which, uh, by the way, guys, I'm sure that you can tell the video is, is lagging a little bit uh, from the audio. We, we had tested this before we went live. It started to kind of get a little better as we went along. So hopefully that is going to be the case as we go along here as well. So, uh, But let me go through and kind of tell you first a little bit about Dr. Furlong. Dr. Furlong, has he got his Ph.D. in New Testament studies. I'm not sure how to pr pronounce that. Is that Verge, Verge Universal? Uh, University in Amsterdam. How do you pronounce that? Oh, you might be muted. Um, awesome. Okay, we can hear you now. So, you can. Okay, yeah. 
Free university is good. It's uh, free university. Okay. And you got your master's with a constant concentration in biblical studies from the University of Notre Dame, as well as a um, uh, MA in classical and Near Eastern studies from the University of Minnesota, and a BA with distinction in classics, sum cum laude, at University of Colorado at Boulder. If you go to his website, you can find information at deanfurlong.com, D-E-A-N-F-U-R-L-O-N-G.com, where you'll find articles, his dissertation, book reviews, and more information on that as well. But he did his dissertation on the identity of John, the author of Revelation and the Gospel of John, interacting, as I said before, with much of Mark Mark Hitchcock's work, Gentry and others, which I imagine is going to be a lot of uh, kind of the conversation and the debate today on who was the author of Revelation. So um, anyways, uh, Dean, uh, welcome to Talking Christianity. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. And for James Rockford, he is, uh, so he's, he's written a book. He's also got a website, Evidence Unseen. Um, Evidence Unseen, Exposing the Myth of Blind Faith, that was written in tw- and published in 2013. Endless Hope or Hopeless End, The Bible and the End of Human History in 2016. And Too Good to Be True, Question, How We, got to hev- how we Get to Heaven, what it, will, what it Will Be Like, and Why We Can't Live Without It in 2016. He's an elder at Zenos uh, Christian Fellowship, where he teaches uh, classes in theology, apologetics, and weekly Bible studies. He graduated uh, magna cum laude from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School with his master's in theological studies. In his free time, he enjoys writing, playing music, drawing, and leading a home church. He lives in Columbus, Ohio with his wife and two sons. So James, thank you for coming on talk, Talking Christianity. It's good to have you as well. Yeah, glad to be here. Okay, guys, so let me tell you a little bit about our format, and then we're going to jump right into this and not delay it any longer. The format is going to be James Rockford's going to get us going with each one of these uh, different categories. The first is going to be 20-minute opening statements, pretty standard, then seven-minute rebuttals uh, where we transition to 10-minute cross-examinations. We'll do two rounds of that, Uh, and then we'll go into 10 minutes of open dialogue with five-minute closing statements for each. And I also want you guys to know in the audience that uh, you'll have a chance to call in with your questions. You should be able to see that up on your screen. Uh, That number is going to be 816-866-0025. We do that at the end of all of our dialogues and conversations. That way you as a a listener have a chance to kind of participate and not not just take in information, but you can kind of challenge some of the the, uh, information that's been presented. Obviously, the two positions are going to be the early date versus the late date. And uh, you've also, you've got a link in the description box on whatever platform you're watching from. You should have a link in the description box. If you don't want to call in, you can actually join the live stream with us and uh, talk to James and and, uh, Dr. Furlong um, in person and go from there. So um, if you want to do that, you can. If you don't want to do either one of those, you obviously can type in your questions into the comment section and we'll be able to get that. Um, So Don Sternman, you say, uh, how long do you anticipate this going or is it undetermined? I I, I think that it's probably going to go about an hour and a half for the actual debate and then we will will, um, go to the audience participation side where you can get your questions in. So we'll probably do 20, 30 minutes for audience Q&A. See, however long you guys want to go on that side of it, but I do want to Make sure that we give you the chance to get your questions in and answered and go from there. So, all right. Well, um, with that said, I think uh, we've got everything covered that we need to. Um, unless, Dean or James, do you have anything we need to cover before we get rolling? No, looking good. Okay, perfect. Let me cut that ticker off. I, I think that says now. So don't call in now. Please don't call in now with your questions. Call in at the end. Uh, I'll give you more of a heads up when we get their audience. So. Anyways, let me cut this camera back to you, James. You're going to get us started first. And I think that... Oh, you've got to get your PowerPoint pulled up so I can share the screen there. I don't think I see that on my side yet. And while he's pulling that up, guys, please do me a favor and help me share this. Uh, For whatever reason, uh, Facebook was making me share each link individually. Usually I could... could, um, I could basically just click and share to different groups. Uh, But if you would, and you think this is an important topic or somebody would want to hear it and listen to it, uh, please feel free to, to, uh, to share this in whatever group that you want to. So anyways, let me get this on here. Hopefully 
that will get it. Uh, I need to get the 20 minute ticker on there as well. Can you see the uh, PowerPoint there, John? Yes, I can see it. I think we're right. I think we're good to go there. So, all right, let me. Whenever you start, I'll start the timer and uh, go from there. Great. Well, I'll be defending the Domitian date for the Book of Revelation. Begin. Why is this subject so significant? Why is it that we're even debating? date of the book of Revelation. Well, to be sure, whenever we look at these different uh, New Testament books, it is vital to know when they date in order to do proper exegesis and also just to be able to understand the cultural and historical milieu against which these books are um, set. When it comes to the subject of the book of Revelation, this date of this book is extremely important. So, if the Neuronic book, or excuse me, the Neuronic date of the book of Revelation is true, that's going to have serious consequences on our interpretation. And uh, so too, if the Domitianic date is true, that will have serious consequences as well. Now, why is this the case? Well, for one, the book of Revelation, on a number of occasions, claims that it is a book of prophecy. It is a book of prophecy. And it claims to foretell, quote, the things which must soon take place. Now, if the book of Revelation was written during the time of Nero, and this is course, from the dates of A.D. 54 to A.D. 68, then this means that preterism, which is an interpretive system for understanding the book of Revelation, that this could in fact be true, because preterism interprets the book of Revelation as being fulfilled somewhere in the Jewish war from A.D. 66 to A.D. 70. However, if the Domitianic date is true, this would mean that the book of Revelation is not a book of prophecy with regard to the Jewish war. Instead, it is a book of history. And so this wouldn't be looking prospectively to the things which must soon take place under Nero and into uh, the AD 66 to 70 uh, time frame. But instead, this would be looking retrospectively back at these uh, periods of time. Kenneth Gentry, who is uh, one of the foremost advocates of preterism and the early date, he states this. He says, if the late date of around AD 95 is accepted, a wholly different situation would prevail. The events in the mid to late 60s of the first century would be absolutely excluded as possible fulfillments. Likewise, R.C. Sproul, in his book, The Last Days According to Jesus, writes this, quote, if the book was written after A.D. 70, then its contents manifestly do not refer to events surrounding the fall of Jerusalem. Unless, of course, the book is a wholesale fraud, having been composed after the predicted events had already occurred. The burden for preterists then is to demonstrate that Revelation was written before AD 70. Now, if you are a futurist, that is to say that you believe that the book of Revelation is fulfilled future to our own day today, well, it wouldn't matter when the book of Revelation was written either in the Neuronic date or in the Domitianic date. It wouldn't matter. In fact, Zane Hodges, who is one of the, or the late Zane Hodges, one of the foremost uh, futurists and dispensationalists, he held to the early date, the Neuronic date of the book of Revelation. And in fact, there's another scholar who holds to the early date of Revelation who is not a preterist either. I'm speaking, of course, of Dr. Dean Furlong is not a preterist. 
So he is not defending preterism, although he is defending the historical contention that the book of Revelation was dated under uh, Nero, probably AD 65, according to his reckoning. Well, that kind of sets the stage. Why then would we hold to an early, or rather a late date for the book of Revelation? Well, for one, the scholarly consensus favors the Domitianic date. This is the consensus among 20th century scholars. It is the broad consensus. It is widely accepted. It is the scholarly majority, the dominant theory. Most modern scholars accept the Domitianic date, and it's the most widely held view. Indeed, Robert Mounts, who is an eminent scholar of the book of Revelation, states, that the neuronic date is held by, quote, very few contemporary writers. Now, this doesn't mean that the early date is therefore false. But what this does mean is that the majority of scholars have held to this view. Why is it that the consensus of scholarship and New Testament studies is held to this view? Well, there are two different independent lines of evidence that support the late date for the book of Revelation. The first of which is external evidence for the late date. External evidence is evidence that comes from outside of the text itself. So here we begin with this Bishop of Lyon in France. Now, What's important about his testimony is this. Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp. He says that he even remembers where he was sitting when he was listening to Polycarp teach. And he, quote, I recounted his conversation with John to Irenaeus. So what we have here is, with regard to relational proximity, a very close connection between Irenaeus and the author of the book of Revelation. So too, Polycarp was, quote, the bishop of the church in Smyrna in which the book of Revelation originally circulated. So not only do we have a close relational proximity, but we have a close geographical proximity. That is to say, John taught Polycarp, who taught Irenaeus, and John wrote his letter to the church in which Irenaeus, or excuse me, uh, Polycarp pastored. Now, is Irenaeus a credible uh, historical source? Well, he is clear and weighty, according to the great uh, historian Philip Schaff. The credit of this witness is good, according to J. A. T. Robinson. Irenaeus sheds, quote, significant light on the historical accuracy of the New Testament, according to Hank Hanegraaff. And his witness carries considerable weight, according to Steve Gregg. Now, what's interesting about all of these citations is that all of these come from early date advocates, either preterists or those who affirm the early date. What is it that Irenaeus stated that carries so much historical weight? Well, he says this in uh, Book 5 of Against Heresies. Quote, if it had been necessary to announce his name, uh, in essence, the beast, plainly at the present time, it would have been spoken by him, John, who saw the apocalypse. For it was not seen long ago, but almost in our own time at the end of the reign of Domitian. So the Domitianic date is very strong right off the bat. We're seeing that it was not seen, namely the apocalypse or the revelation, the vision, and that this dates not just in some nebulous way to the reign of Domitian from AD 81 to 96, but that this dates to the end of the reign of Domitian. Now, what we see here is when this uh, uh, participle here, uh, harathe in Greek, when this refers to it, it was not seen long ago, 
Most would interpret this to mean the it refers to the nearest antecedent, the apocalypse. So the apocalypse or the book of Revelation was not seen. However, and this would include Dr. Dean Furlong, would say that it isn't the nearest antecedent, but the second nearest antecedent. So it does not refer to the apocalypse, but to John, the author. He was not seen. So under this view, John was the one who was seen, not the apocalypse itself. Well, I'd like to give five reasons why I believe that this is a, a, a mistaken interpretation of Irenaeus. Number one, the nearest antecedent is the apocalypse. So let's do some quick grammar here. If I was to say this sentence, John picked up Alex at the store. He needed to buy groceries. He needed to buy groceries. To whom does he refer? Well, uh, according to standard hermeneutics or interpretation, the he refers to Alex, the nearest antecedent, not all the way back to John. Second, Eusebius begins and ends this section with the apocalypse. So we read at the very beginning of this section in Eusebius's work, uh, book five, uh, I believe it's chapter 30, he begins in this opening section, he says this, quote, Irenaeus speaks about the apocalypse of John. That's how this chapter begins. And then we read, but almost in our own time, at the end of the reign of Domitian, now look at this, these things are related by the aforesaid about the apocalypse. So the chapter begins with the apocalypse, and the chapter ends with the apocalypse. The focus is not John. Number three, the context refers to how John saw the apocalyptic vision, not how John himself was seen. Look at this clause here. For it was not seen. The word here is uh, herathe in Greek. Look up a line just above it. Okay, a line just above it, who saw the apocalypse. The same Greek word is used. And to what is it used? The apocalypse. Who saw the apocalypse? Same word. For it was not seen. Arathe, same word. And this, of course, is referring to the apocalypse. In other words, if, if the same referent or direct object is the case in the first clause, so too it is the same referent or direct object in the second clause, or same modifier in the second clause. Number four, John saw Horao in these visions no less than seven times. So the same word that is used for John in the book of Revelation, seeing these apocalyptic visions, the book of Revelation was seen, the, the same word is used in Irenaeus, and it's also used in Eusebius to describe how John saw the apocalypse itself. Finally, oh, and I should point out um, the, the word saw, and I saw, and I was taken, and I saw, is used something on the order of 50 times in the book of Revelation. So the referent here most likely refers to um, of the apocalypse, not to John himself. Number five, later church fathers thought Irenaeus' statement was crystal clear. Indeed, the revisionist reading of this statement, for it was not seen long ago to refer to John, was not propounded until the 18th century by Johannes J. Wettstein in 1751. And it shouldn't surprise us that Vetstein was a preterist. So for 1,600 years, no one revised Irenaeus' statement here. Instead, what we see is that this was just held to be um, part and parcel with what was being taught. J. A. T. Robinson, who is an early date advocate, says that the translation has been disputed 
by a number of scholars on the ground that it means that he, John, was seen. But this is very dubious. One must assume that Irenaeus believed the apocalypse to have come from AD 95. Victorinus, who is the uh, earliest extant or existent commentator on the book of Revelation, writes this. He says, quote, when John said these things, he was in the island of Patmos, condemned to the labor of the mines by Caesar the mission. There he saw the apocalypse. The mission being killed, all his judgments were discharged, and John being dismissed from the mine. So after the mission died, the edict of exile and banishment was rescinded and he was taken back from his imprisonment. Victorinus again in 1710 says, the time must be understood in which the written apocalypse was published since then reigned Caesar the mission. So our closest extant source, Irenaeus, and our earliest uh, extant commentary, Victorinus, both support the Domitianic date. Tertullian in AD 200, he writes this, he says, Rome, where Peter endures a passion like his Lord's, that's being crucified, yes, where Paul wins his crown in a death like John the Baptist's, beheaded, yes, where the apostle John was first plunged unhurt into boiling oil, and thence remitted to his island exile. Now here's what's odd. Peter was crucified, and Paul was beheaded, and Paul was a Roman citizen. But John, a Jewish man, was exiled? How does this make any sense? Well, historically we know that Domitian banished his enemies. And we have a case in point with Flavia Domitilla, who was banished around the same time as uh, John the Apostle in AD 95. Why was she banished? Well, some people have said, according to Eusebius, that she was a Christian. At the very least, she was banished because of, quote, her atheism and for, quote, adopting the Jewish mode of life. She was banished for her religious beliefs. Later, Emperor Nerva released her in AD 96, which is the same pattern that we see with Domitian. And Jerome and Eusebius interpret this section from Tertullian as referring to Domitian as well. Well, what about Jerome? When John said these things, he was in the island of Patmos, condemned to the labor of the mines by Caesar Domitian. There he saw the apocalypse. And what about Eusebius, the great church historian? He confirms the Domitianic date in Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, and Tertullian. So just to summarize, when we're referring to, and, and let me be very clear here, to explicit references, explicit references to the Domitianic date, what do we see? We see that the closest known witness to John affirms the Domitianic date. The earliest extant commentary on Revelation affirms the Domitianic date. The great church historian Eusebius affirms this, as does Jerome, who was a, a polymath, historian, translator, and commentator. What do we see for Nero? Well, we don't see any explicit, now catch my language, explicit references to the Neuronic date until two Syriac texts in the beginning of the F.J. Hort says this as an early dater. He says, if external evidence alone could decide, there would be clear preponderance for Domitian. What about internal evidence? John's ministry in Ephesus would overlap with Paul and Timothy. At the end of 2 Timothy, Paul mentions 17 people by name, but never mentions John. Why doesn't Jesus mention Paul or Timothy to the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2? Moreover, Jesus affirms the Ephesian rejection of false prophets, and yet Paul warns Timothy false teachers. Number two, the Church of Smyrna may not have existed in the 8060s. 
Polycarp says, Paul commended you, Philippians, in the beginning of his epistles. He boasts of you and all those churches which alone then knew the Lord, but we of Smyrna had not yet known him. Uh, Philippians dates from AD 60, 61, somewhere in there. Number three, Laodicea would need an earthquake at AD 60, and yet we know that the rebuilding lasted until AD 80. So just to conclude, the uh, summary here is the Domitianic date is held by scholarly consensus. It has the only explicit references for the first 400 years. It is held by the closest extant witness. It was held by the first extant commentary by the best Christian historian, and it fits the internal evidence. Awesome. Thank you, James, for that. I am... Uh, okay, um, Okay. so I was trying to get my camera pulled up. So I'm going to try to adjust the background on the color for the countdown timer. So give me just a second here. I think we should be good. I need to yeah, adjust that back I to 20. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't see the, uh, the time. No, you know what? It was, it was pretty, it was kind of, it was my fault. So, um, okay. Now, uh, Dean, I'm going to turn it over to you. Let me see if I can get your PowerPoint up with your PIP. And so I think we've Dean, got I don't know if I went over or not, but if I did, let's let you go over for a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I think you did go over maybe uh, about 30, 45 seconds or so, so, uh, which okay, I th cool. is totally fine. We're pretty laxed on that, but I think we are wrapping up your point. Okay, so, cool. which Dean, I, I, I wonder if you're muted, by the way, I don't I'm trying to figure out what's going on there. I couldn't hear you. It looked like you were trying to talk. Oh, you've got yourself muted. Okay. How's that? <laughs> Perfect. Okay. That okay. Yep. And it looks uh, like we've gone me, back. Um, okay. Yeah, let me, I had to unmute, so let me, uh, right, right. let me fix the PowerPoint. Perfect. And whenever you're ready, I'll just, uh, I'll start the timer. All right, um, we'll have a rebuttal time, I guess, afterwards. So I won't address uh, those points right now, but we will get into them. Hopefully we'll get into all of those, uh, every single point. Uh, I just want to mention that out of all of the evidence that's been brought forward so far, um, actually no uh, early church writers even ad address or discuss Irenaeus' statement other than uh, Eusebius. And um, we're gonna, we'll get into that. Uh, Tertullian just says that John was exiled. He doesn't mention the name of the emperor. Clement of Alexandria doesn't mention the name of the emperor. So um, uh, Polycarp, we'll get into that, but all he says is that um, the church at, at uh, Smyrna hadn't been at the time that uh, the church, uh, the letter to Philippians was written. So again, we'll look at that, hopefully, join the, I'll get into all of that, join the rebuttal. Um, for now though, I'm gonna give you a completely different uh, kind of take on some of the early Christian evidence. I appreciate um, James noting that, you know, I'm not a preterist. Um, I, you know, I do think that preterism needs to be examined on exegetical grounds, not necessarily on on um, on this grounds, because I think on this, I think the evidence does support them on the on the data. All right, so I'll I'll kick off. I've mentioned that you know Tertullian, Clement, uh, and some of the other writers that are that have been mentioned don't actually explicitly even mention the name of the emperor. In fact, there are few clear statements about when John was exiled or when Revelation was written. Just four hundred years of um, of church history. <clears throat> the first unambiguous undisputed placement of John's exile in Domitian's reign is found in Victorinus, uh, writing around the year 300. Eusebius follows him in around the year 320. But, uh, and we can, notice, we can talk about this later, but Victorinus seems to have placed John's exile early in uh, Domitian's reign. Nobody before Eusebius placed it within the context of the persecution of the Roman nobility until uh, Eusebius came along and did that, which I think is kind of, you know, a little suspicious in and of itself. <clears throat> now, I mentioned there's no explicit dating, 
That doesn't mean that we can't take away anything from the, uh, the ancient writings. For example, the moratorium canon, it's usually dated to about 180. I would date it maybe 50 years later than that, but the consensus is about 180. And that does not date uh, the revelation at all, but it does claim that Paul wrote his seven letters uh, following the example of John. Uh, obviously, you know, that, that means that Paul wrote his seven letters after Revelation was written. <clears throat> now that's, you know, that I'm not bringing that forward as evidence of my position because as, as Mark, Hitch, excuse me, Mark Hitchcock pointed out, um, that seems to have a very early date, earlier than, than the Neronian date. And in fact, in my dissertation, I argued that the moratorium fragment uh, placed it in Claudius's reign. But um, the point there is really that even though the evidence is not explicit, it doesn't mean it's useless. It doesn't mean that we can't pull information from it. And uh, a lot of the evidence I'm going to bring is going to be like that. It's going to be inferential. And, um, and we're going to start with, uh, I'm going to, have uh, four pieces of evidence. I'm going to also appeal to Irenaeus, so <laughs> we're both appealing to Irenaeus, and I'm also going to appeal to Tertullian and Clement of Alexandria, and I'm also going to bring the Acts of John into this. Acts of John were written uh, possibly the same time Irenaeus wrote, uh, possibly a bit later, uh, sometime in the second or third century, early third century. Uh, they're written by Gnostics, but um, but they they utilize established Johannine traditions. So you know you know John's uh, life and ministry in Ephesus and in the province of Asia. All right, we're going to start with Irenaeus, and uh, like I said, we're going to go into into you know um, how whether it's ambiguous, the closest antecedent, etc. We'll get into that during the rebuttal later. But I want to bring some evidence from a different part of uh, Irenaeus. Uh, okay, here's some early date proponents, um, but we'll get into that later. So if you notice here, in a different section, Irenaeus talks about how John came to write his gospel, and he notes that it was take away the error which had been uh, disseminated among men by Cerinthus, who was a, a heretic, and uh, a long time previously by those termed Nicolaitans. So I want to draw attention to um, this statement that John wrote to remove the error that was being sown by Cerinthus and which had been sown a long time previously by the Nicolaitans. So according to Irenaeus, Cerinthus was around at the time of the writing of the Gospel of John, but the Nicolaitans had been active a long time before then. Now, we know that um, Cerinthus was active at the end of the first century uh, because um, Irenaeus relates the story of how John and Polycarp entered into the baths of Ephesus and saw him. And so he must have been contemporary with, uh, with Polycarp. Also, if the Nicolaitans have been active a long time previously, then we need some time for, for that to have um, for them to have already been active. Now, Irenaeus also says, and of course the book of Revelation says this as well, that the Nicolaitans were active at the time of the writing of Revelation. So right here we have the Gospel of John in the reign, in, sorry, in the time of Cerinthus, and we have the book of Revelation a long time previous to this. Um, uh, if we, um, uh, if we uh, draw the, the inferences from that. Time of Cerinthus, time of John's Gospel. Time of the Nicolaitans, time of Revelation. And the Nicolaitans were active a long time previous to Cerinthus. Therefore, uh, Revelation must have been written a long time previous to John's Gospel as well. Now, uh, other church writers Confirm this. Eusebius himself says that uh, the Nicolaitans were active for a very short time, and he says in less time than it than it has taken to tell it. Sorry, in less time than it has taken to tell, it became entirely 
extinct. So these Nicolaitans were not around a whole lot of time. Eusebius is very clear that um, he's very emphatic that they that they cease to exist very very quickly. All right, and here's the story I was mentioning earlier about Cerinthus being uh, contemporaneous with with uh, Polycarp. Now, here's where Irenaeus mentions that the Nicolaitans were addressed by the Apocalypse of John. And he also talks about um, how Nicholas was one of the deacons mentioned in the book of Acts. And also Hippolytus credited to the Nicolaitans, the, um, he says that it was their teaching that Hymenaeus and Philetus were following that uh, Paul addresses in 2 Timothy. And he also says that they were the false teachers at Corinth, addressed by Paul. This places them, according to Hippolytus, this places them um, in the 50s and in the 60s. And if we notice here the Nicolaitans in Revelation, it says um, you have the doctrine, you have those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, and uh, you have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, some people say they're the same group, some people say they're not. Um, that's not really my point. The point is, that we see this doctrine of Balaam mentioned in other writings that we would date to the 60s, not to the 90s. We see the doctrine of Balaam mentioned in Second Peter uh, and in Jude, and we see the same kinds of things. The um, uh, the uh, the um, fornication um, in both of these, in all of these writings, uh, attributed or associated with these groups. All right, that's the evidence from Irenaeus. Now we're going to go on to Tertullian. Now here uh, at the top, we've already seen this quote. Uh, he describes Rome as the place where Peter uh, attains to the suffering of the Lord, where Paul is crowned with the departure of John the Baptist, where the apostle John, after he was plunged into boiling oil, having suffered, suffered nothing, is exiled to an island. Now, some people argue from this that, that Peter, Paul, and John because of the way that they're all mentioned uh, together like this, or juxtaposed together, that John was exiled at the same time. Now, I think that may be a suggestive argument, but it's not, it's not conclusive. However, uh, what we do have, we have a quotation from Jerome, and Jerome quotes uh, from Tertullian, from a presumably lost work of Tertullian. And in this work, Tertullian uh, actually claimed, according to Jerome's quote, that to tell, uh, that John was plunged into boiling oil by Nero. Now, this was actually changed in the, in the printed editions of the 16th, uh, 16th century because of its support of the Neronian dating. They said, oh no, this, this couldn't have happened in Nero's reign. We know it happened in Domitian's reign. So if you check uh, online translation, it might say that Tertullian, uh, it might say, uh, have Jerome saying that John was, uh, plunged into oil at Rome, but the original Latin manuscripts all say by Nero. And Jerome also noted elsewhere that uh, ecclesiastical histories reported that John went immediately to Patmos following the oil immersion. Though we get that from, uh, we get that from Tertullian, right? Having been plunged into boiling oil, circumstantial participle, um, he was exiled to an island. And Philip Schaff just mentioned, you know, this crazy tradition of the boiling oil sounds like something Nero would have done. Um, the gardens of Nero, the Vatican Hill, where he uh, crucified uh, Christians. He also lit them up in uh, as candles at night by placing mantles of um, which have been immersed in boiling oil uh, onto them. And it would appear that instead of placing a coat onto John, John himself was plunged uh, into the oil. Also, the punishment for magic uh, was the exile. So if you survive being burned in uh, boiling oil, then uh, exile would definitely be uh, something that you might uh, experience. Sorcerers, philosophers, orators were all um, exiled. All right, Clement of Alexandria. He says that after the death of the tyrant, John came to Ephesus. And from there, he traveled to the neighboring regions where he ordained 
uh, bishops in the churches. So uh, he would have gone around that area. Now, on one occasion, it says that John visited a city not far from Ephesus, and he committed a young man to the, to the care of the bishop in the city. And uh, I just want you to get an idea of the, the kind of time uh, sequence we're looking at here. He says that the bishop reared the young man, kept him, and at last enlightened or baptized him. After that, however, the, the bishop relaxed his care and the young man began at first attending feasts with other youths of his own age. Next, uh, he began going on nighttime robberies with them, accompanying them on their nighttime robberies. And then uh, they urged him on to greater crimes. So we've got a progression of time here, at first, next, and then then. Gradually, bit by bit, little by little, he became accustomed to this way of life until at last or finally he renounced salvation. He then cast aside all restraint and he went on to form his own band of robbers who excelled in violence and murder. According to Chrysostom, uh, the young man was a chief of robbers for a long time. But Clement carries on. After some time, John returned to the original city and he wanted to know what had happened to the young man. And, uh, and so they tell him the story, you know, how what, what had taken place. John asks for a horse and he rides out to the robber's outpost uh, so that he can be brought into custody by the robbers and taken to the young man. However, when the young man recognized John, um, he was too ashamed to face him and he tried to run away. And it says that John, forgetful of his age, uh, rigorously pursued him and uh, he caught up with him and he promised him that he would pray for him uh, and find him uh, forgiveness. And so the young man agreed to go back and John brought him back to the church. And it's, uh, Clement says that John did not leave him until he had restored him to the church. Now, according to the Domitianic view, all of this happened in the two years between Domitian's death in 96 and John's death in about the year 98, which is when uh, Eusebius' chronicle places it. Now, we notice that John rode a horse, he grabbed a horse, he rode out on a horse, he rigorously with all of his strength ran after the young man and he shouted out with a loud voice you know young man why are you running away from me and um according to the, a tradition preserved by jerome in john's extreme old age he was barely able to talk and he was unable to walk he had to be carried into the meetings the only thing he could muster was little children love each other and um and so, you know, not only is the period, it seems to be more than, you know, can be fitted into just two years, but even if you could compress all of that into two years, the young man falling away, uh, the young man being trained, being baptized, uh, gradually falling away bit by bit, um, at last becoming a chief robber for a long time. And then uh, John finally bringing him back to the church and restoring him, even if you could uh, somehow compress that into two years. Um, we still have this issue that John simply could, could barely speak and couldn't walk in his old age. All right, my last piece of evidence is the Acts of John, usually dated to the second or third century, actually giving it a bit of a late date there. But um, anyway, so this records the uh, travels of John. The beginning of the work is missing, and it starts out at Miletus, which is a city, a port, near Ephesus and um, it has him travel from Miletus to Ephesus and then to Smyrna uh, and then there's evidence that uh, he visited Pergamos and then at last he goes uh, to Laodicea and from Laodicea he returns to Ephesus where uh, it records his death. Um, he died in Ephesus. Now probably it recorded him traveling to all seven churches of uh, the province of Asia in order right because um the first and second and last church do correspond with the first second and last church of revelation the middle of the acts of john is missing so we can't verify uh 
whether it had him uh, traveling across those churches, but the evidence seems to suggest it had him traveling the seven churches. And evidence from Tertullian seems to, uh, seems to back that up because Tertullian says that the, the bishops of the seven churches uh, had John as their founder. So it seems that John did personally visit the seven churches of Revelation. And of course, Clement of Alexandria, we've already seen this, it says after the death of the tyrant, he returned from Patmos, he went to, to Ephesus, and then he went to the neighboring areas, the neighboring region in Asia, and he appointed bishops. So it all seems to point to a picture of John, um, if we include Clement, of John after his return from Patmos, going to Ephesus and then traveling from there and ordaining the bishops in the churches. Now the beginning of the Acts of John is missing, but as I mentioned, the uh, it begins, the beginning, the extent beginning starts at Miletus, which is a port city near Ephesus. And um, what was in the last beginning? Well, as it pointed out, uh, Miletus would be a natural stopping point between Patmos and Ephesus. So it certainly is not, it does not provide evidence for the late date uh, because um, it just records after he returned from Laodicea, it just records his death in Ephesus. There's no mention of any exile. But the evidence does seem to agree with Clement, or at least is consistent with Clement, that he, um, that he went to, that it had recorded his uh, exile first. There's also a 12th century uh, source tradition that says that John was exiled at Miletus on his way back from Patmos. So, you know, it all fits together. No, I can't prove the Acts of John definitely, you know, 100% without any doubt, but it all fits together. It all points in that direction. There's some other later uh, documents. Uh, James has already mentioned some of them. The Syriac History of John, about the year 400, placed uh, John's exile in Nero's reign. The uh, Syriac translation of Revelation, I've seen various dates as early as the fourth century to as late as the sixth century. Um, Knox's recent commentary puts it as early as the fourth century commentary on Revelation. Uh, says that uh, the revelation was made by God to John uh, uh, in Patmos, where he was banished uh, by Nero Caesar. We've got Iconius, he identified the seven kings of Revelation as seven emperors. I don't agree with that, but uh, that's one for the Preterists, because uh, that's their view. And uh, he identified the sixth head, who is said to be the one who is as, uh, as Nero. Then we've got a rebirth of Caesarea. He says that the destruction of uh, Jerusalem had not overtaken, had not happened, had not occurred when the evangelists prophesied these things. And we have two uh, later writers who both claimed that John the Seer was in Patmos 32 years after the ascension to replace it in Nero's reign. All right, let me. Uh, Joshua, do you um, close me out at this point? Because uh, that is uh, that is it for my presentation of the evidence. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thank you for that, Dean. We are going to transition into our seven-minute rebuttals. Let me get these. Let me get James back on the screen here. I'm going to add you to the left, and Dean, you should be on the right. That looks good. Uh, so we'll have seven-minute rebuttals, and let me put just James on there. And I'm going to fix this clock here because it was at 20 minutes. So we'll get that down to seven. Cool. I can't see it in my PowerPoint. Uh, you should be able to see it on the camera view. It's up in the top right uh, corner. Uh, or if you just look at... So you should have a screen where you can actually see what is being broadcast. Um, if you look at the broadcast screen, you should be able to see that. That's okay. I'll just do a... Uh, what do you call it? An old-fashioned timer. How about that. Okay. Um, are you? Do you need your? And do you, do you need the PowerPoint up, or are you just? Uh... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This will be my uh, rebuttal, first rebuttal. Perfect. Okay, we'll get the PowerPoint up there. Can you see it? Okay. Yes, sir. We got it, and I will uh, start the timer whenever you're ready. Great. Okay. 
Well, um, Dean, as he said, gave a number of what he referred to as inferential arguments. And I think that's a real key difference between uh, his case and my case. I would say that my case is more referential arguments, that these are references, and his are more inferential arguments. So let me just take the, the top four that he uh, cited here. Uh, I gotta move forward here, sorry. Okay, so with regard to Irenaeus, and this is not the section from Against Heresies, Book 5, this is the argument that he gave from the Nicolaitans. If you remember, to summarize his case, he's saying that the Nicolaitans existed in the time of Nero in the 8060s. They existed for a very short time, uh, according to Eusebius, Book 3, Chapter 29. And uh, they existed a long time before Serinthus. So if Serinthus lived at the end of the, the first century and the Nicolaitans were in the 60s and they were separated by uh, several decades, this would be a good inferential case that when the book of Revelation was written, speaking about this heresy of the Nicolaitans or the, the uh, uh problem with uh, Balaam, that this would be a good case. Well, to this, I would just respond that when it says the short time and the long time mentioned here, that the Nicolaitans existed for a short time or a long time before Serenthus, uh, this isn't specified. We aren't given a number of years. We aren't told the amount of time that is, is spanning between the two. We're just given these very nebulous um, temporal markers, as he puts it. So, too, in Eusebius's work, and this is important, when Eusebius is referring to the bathhouse incident of Serinthus, that makes it sound very uh, scary or something. But uh, when John and Polycarp went into uh, the bathhouse and they see the heretic Serinthus, he refers to that. And then he says, in Church History, Book 3, he says, at this time also. So, referring to Serinthus, at this time also, there existed for a very short time the so-called heresy of the Nicolaitans, of which the Apocalypse of John makes mention. Philip Schaff says, the views of the fathers with regard to the Nicolaitans are very confusing. Irenaeus says that Nicholas, one of the seven who was chosen in Acts chapter 6, was the founder of the Nicolaitans, whereas Clement of Alexandria says that Nicholas was a good father and a good husband, and uh, he was accused of being uh, jealous of his beautiful wife, and so he offered to give his wife away uh, out of purity, and Philip Schaff says that's completely absurd. But uh, regardless, uh, it shows that these two uh, men uh, these two depictions of the Nicolaitans are conflicting, and it shows that they existed at the same time. Well, what about Tertullian? We see that John um, saw on the island of Patmos an apocalypse, and, and as Dr. Furlong pointed out, Tertullian was sent to where? To Rome? Well, no, this is switched by Vitteroli in... Uh, excuse me, Vittori, in 1564, this was switched from uh, Nero, by Nero, to at Rome. And Jerome comments that he was, uh, John was banished immediately to Patmos. And so that's uh, Dean's case here, is that this was switched, and it was uh, originally in Jerome as by Nero and so forth. The problem is, as Dean Furlong himself points out on page 111 of his book, there are no extant texts of Tertullian that relate this. Jerome and Eusebius, moreover, both affirmed the Domitianic banishment. Okay, so even in the context, Domitian is mentioned. And this mention of the terracotta jar and him coming out fresher and more active, this just seems to me to be hagiography, a uh, hagios meaning saint and graphe meaning writing. 
So I, I do not find this to be a powerful evidence. And moreover, if Jerome can interpret Tertullian, then Jerome and Eusebius can interpret Tertullian with regard to the Domitianic banishment. Even if it's true, this never states when John received his vision. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, this whole ex example that uh, Dr. Furlong gave that um, John talked to a youth, that he was baptized, he was reared, the time passed. Here's my questions for this. How much time transpired? I would like to, to get a definite date on that. How long is too long? Moreover, converts fall away quickly. In fact, this is one of the difficulties with the internal evidence for uh, what we find in uh, the church of Laodicea, that they fell away quickly. And people can be restored quickly. For example, the apostle Peter. Clement teaches that John was old, so this would fit with the Domitianic date. And that whole idea of Jerome saying that John needed to be brought in because he couldn't walk, and he always said, uh, love the brethren, love one another, for this is a thing. Think about this. Early date advocates say that John couldn't ride a horse because he was too old, and yet he could be boiled in oil. Think about that. He couldn't ride a horse, but he could be boiled in oil. Finally, Clement's tyrant was Christian, according to Eusebius. Again, if Jerome can interpret um, uh, antecedent author Eusebius. Finally, the Acts of John, I just find this to be the least persuasive of the four central arguments. I see the point. Okay, the point is that John is traveling among the churches and so forth, but we see that this is an argument from silence. As Dr. Furlong points out in page 114 of his book, as, quote, the beginning of the work is lost. It has no mention of banishment. So, too, J.K. Eliot, in his book, The Apocryphal New Testament, writes this. In the East, the earliest unambiguous patristic attestation, the Acts of John is in Eusebius, who condemns the Acts of John and Andrew as heretical. These contents need to be reestablished from several different manuscripts with the help of later descriptions or allusions, as none of them contains the total remaining contents of the original Acts. The name Lucius is often associated with the composition of the original Acts of John. From the 4th century onwards, his name was added as the author of a large number of pious romances. The literary style is in general very simple, with ample borrowings from folklore and pagan literature. The dislocated nature of the surviving scenes and the presence of floating stories make it difficult to evaluate the character intention the original composition moreover it contains quote ascetic and modalistic influences so to conclude there is no explicit reference to the neuronic date only an inferential argument the same sources that allude to nero also affirmed omission no temporal markers and here's the key require a neuronic date and one of the central sources to which dr furlong <laughs> is the Acts of John, which is apocryphal, fragmentary okay. vocal. Awesome. Okay, thanks, James, for that rebuttal. We went a little bit over on time. Dean, if you need to go over on your rebuttal as well, feel free to. And uh, that's yes, probably my fault. I, my fault. <laughs> I hit the I hit the triangle a, uh, with about 17 seconds left. I should have done that with a minute left. So, um, Dean, you've got seven minutes for your rebuttal. Do you need to use your PowerPoint for that, or would you like to uh, just have the video up? Um, yeah, I'm going to need, uh, I'm going to need the power. Okay. Let me get that up there. I, and uh, for those of you who are... Do what? I said to Dean, if he needs to go over, go ahead. I, I just can't see the, uh, uh, the clock. That's all. For sure. Okay. Um, it should, okay. So Dean, I moved it down here at the bottom, so it's not going over any of your writing. 
and I'm doing my best to kind of juggle around the uh, the PIP, the video of you, so that uh, the audience can see the text as well. Uh, sorry if I'm moving that around too much for you guys. I'm, I'm doing the best I can. But okay, Dean. So you've got seven minutes, and whenever you are ready uh, to go, you can start, and I'll start the timer. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. All right, yeah, uh, rebuttal time. I guess we definitely need longer for this, but um, let me uh, let me just try to, to mention a few things. So I think one of the arguments I made was that actually the Domitianic date is not uh, is not uh, established really before um, Eusebius in uh, in the fourth century. You won't find a single writer saying that John was uh, banished in the 90s during the persecution, Domitian's persecution of the Roman aristocracy, which is when Eusebius placed it, which kind of, you know, raises the question, why would John be banished uh, among the aristocratic Romans uh, who were the, uh, the object of Domitian's persecution in the 90s? The, uh, I never said that Tertullian, um, you know, can be used for either. The fact that Jerome was was a late data because uh, he followed Eusebius is kind of irrelevant because he still quotes Tertullian uh, showing that Tertullian placed the exile in Nero's reign, or at least he quotes him showing that he placed the uh, boiling oil incident in Nero's reign. Now, you know, a lot of these writings are lost. We get fragments from other writers. Um, so the fact that the work of Tertullian is not preserved uh, is not necessarily uh, an unusual thing. And in fact, Jerome quotes Tertullian earlier in the same passage, and he gives the name of the book that he's quoting from. So, you know, I think it's highly likely that uh, that story came from the same book. It's a book that's not, not in existence anymore. And um, there are some significant differences between what Jerome relates and what we have uh, from Tertullian himself to show that that they're likely two different sources. The Acts of John, yeah, I mean, you know, scholars have patched together from various sources, but there's no disagreement as to the, uh, concerning the arguments I made as concerning the, you know, the beginning and, um, and the end and the first, second and seventh churches and the beginning at Miletus, um, that is all there. I want to reiterate the point that before Eusebius, there's actually very, very little concerning when John was exiled that is referential. Um, there's Victorinus, though again, I'll point out, he seems to, if I can't have the moratorium fragment because it seems to place it too early for the early date, then I don't believe late daters should have Victorinus either. Um, as hopefully I'll show later on, he says that John grew old on Patmos. So, uh, you know, he seems to have, have placed, um, he seems to have placed John's exile there early in Domitian's reign. He certainly doesn't say that, you know, he was exiled in 93, 94, uh, which is about the time Eusebius uh, placed him in exile, just for, you know, two or three years, doesn't fit. Uh, okay, the, um, I'm using up all my time, I'm supposed to get into Irenaeus. Perhaps we'll be able to get into Irenaeus in the, in the question time. Let me just mention that um, the, um, first of all, here's a list of some, some writers that have taken John to, uh, sorry, taken John as the subject or have said that either John or the vision could have been the subject of uh, error rather it or he was seen, going back to the original argument that James made from Irenaeus. Uh, Wettstein certainly might have been a, a, he was a preterist, but Gottlieb Christoph Harles, he was one of the greatest Greek scholars. He wrote a treasury of Greek writing from Homeric times up until Byzantine times. And he said it could be the one when he was discussing uh, the subject. There's lots of other writers as well, some of whom are, um, are preterists, some were not. Uh, Chase in 1907 was a very distinguished classic, uh, classical scholar of Greek. Uh, Fenton J. Anthony Hall, who uh, was one of the editors of the Greek uh, Testament of uh, <coughs> infamy or, 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 or fame, depending on your view, uh, he discussed it and he noticed the difficulty with the common view, though uh, he came down with the standard view on the basis that had had 
uh, John is the one who was seen, he would have, uh, his argument would have required that he placed it in the reign of Trajan, in whose reign he died. And uh, like I said, I would like to, to get into Irenaeus. I was hoping to discuss it in the rebuttal, but maybe that was a bit too ambitious. Um, but uh, there's some uh, very uh, leading Johannine uh, scholars on here. Uh, you know, uh, who are early daters, who um, who hold uh, the, either uh, John as the as a subject, or at least accept it as a possibility. You can see John Bear's name there. Uh, John Bear, of course, is also the world's leading Irenaeus scholar, um, which is significant, and he holds that the uh, that John is a subject. Ian Boxall is a very distinguished uh, Johannine scholar. He wrote a whole book on Patmos traditions, and uh, he holds to the early date. One thing, and I'd like to get into this a bit uh, later on, like I mentioned before, but um, the, uh, is it not on here? The, uh, the ancient Latin translation of Irenaeus, which it's 100 years at least before, probably before Eusebius, possibly even within a decade or two of uh, Irenaeus, uh, does not accept the, um, sorry, but I guess I didn't put it on here. Did not accept the, um, the uh, vision as the subject of the verb. So you, the Latin translator would not have understood the passages Eusebius did, that the vision was seen in the end of uh, Domitian's reign, but actually uh, has we semest which could refer to John, uh, that would be grammatically possible, but it cannot refer to the apocalyptic vision. There are uh, other things I'd like to cover, hopefully in the, in the question time, um, you know, why isn't John named when Paul wrote uh, to Timothy and, uh, and all these other things. So hopefully we'll get to that later on, but uh, that is, that's the end of my presentation for, for Irenaeus and some of those other points. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Dean. And uh, if you did, if you wanted to go over on time, you could. We had a little bit of time that you could carry over. But um, if we need to go a little long on the cross examination or whatever to make up at that time as we go along, just let me know. Yeah, can, yeah, that would that. that would be great. It looks like I'm probably going to need you know at least five or ten straight minutes for the okay. for Irenaeus. Okay, and uh, let me get James in here. We're going to do our cross examination, which is going to be ten minutes each. And uh, this first round is going to get, so we've got two rounds of 10 minutes each, so it'll be a total of 40 minutes of, uh, or, let's see. So I, I guess I need clarification on that. James, we're doing 10 minutes with you to cross-examine Dean, 10 minutes for Dean to cross-examine you, right? Sure. Yeah, okay. that sounds good. And then are we doing a second round of that as well, where, or, or is it just, uh, is it, was it just, um... Was it, was it? Oh, I, I, you thought, see what I, said? I thought it was just one. Yeah, but it's, it's up to Dean. Okay. Clinton. Okay. And it's one. Yeah, it I should. like he to say, so. Okay. Um, so, Dean, are you good with that then? Uh, when, uh, for one round, it'll be James has 10 minutes, then you have 10 minutes, and then we go to closing statements, or you wanted to do two rounds of each of you have 10 minute periods of to cross examine the other person, a total of basically 20 minutes versus 40 minutes? Oh, um, yeah, uh, that, that, uh, we could do that. Uh, I guess we could always come back to that and reevaluate, uh, you yeah. know, if we don't get everything uh, taken care of, but yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> so uh, let's start out with the 10 minute round first, James, I'll turn it over to you. And, uh, let me, I actually, I need to get that clock up here and then I'll get both of you guys on. Uh, give me just a second. Sorry. 10 minutes here and we should be good there so whenever you're ready uh, James you've got 10 minutes okay cool all right so Dean uh, it's okay if I call you Dean I'm assuming yes please do yep all right uh, uh, over uh, Facebook seemed like that was preferred so all right uh, you said uh, if I caught you correctly that the Latin translation of Tertullian let me get this straight. The visum est could not refer to the apocalypse, but you said that it would actually uh, prefer to refer to John. 
Is that is that what you said? Well, that, that neuter participle would actually prefer. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh. So, the um. What I mentioned, what I said is that it couldn't refer to the vision because that would be Wiesa s. Uh, Wiesum as it is yes. can either be uh, Wiesum is usually understood to be a neuter uh, di uh, neuter subject. However, yes. the um, and I, I document this in the book, but there there is uh, evidence in Latin for the use of a uh, uh, accusative subject in uh, with verbs with passive verbs. So um, another issue is that uh, usum um, and you know I quoted some uh, Latin uh, experts, uh, and I, I um, in the book, but usum um were often interchangeable in medieval Greek manuscripts, and even as far back to the second century in certain uh, certain parts of the Roman Empire, uh, the um, Usunum, uh, uh, the um ending is not necessarily evidence for the um, for the accused for the neuter state or for the accusative state. So now, to summarize that, for, I'm sorry to interrupt. Would this be for later Latin, or would this be for Latin that was contemporaneous with the third century? It would be contemporaneous in certain regions. Um, I think even uh, the translation was believed to happen. It's in my book. It's either in Gaul or North Africa, but whatever region it was, right. um, this the, the accusative subject using an accusative subject with verbs with passive verbs, um, which is one of the most common mistakes I see people learning Latin is using an accusative. But it's it's attested. It's attested from this time. Okay. Uh, how would you respond to J.T. Robinson's uh, redating of the New Testament, page 222, where he says, quote, the Latin translation, visum, is definitely against the person, though if referring to the apocalypse, it should be visa. Visum would have to refer to the nomen or name of the beast. Yeah, so, um, so he was participle. Would not be referring to a, be, an apocalypse or a, a masculine name. Hang on, so could you repeat that last bit? Yeah. So the visa asked would be a neuter passive participle. Uh, we would agree that that cannot refer to the apocalypse. Contra Mark Hitchcock and G.K. Beale and uh, anyone else who has argued that in the past, Kenneth Gentry. Um, but the name of the beast is the would be the best antecedent for the Latin, which would be um, neuter. Um, why wouldn't that be the the, the best um, modifier of uh, that neuter passive participle? Well, I think it would be attributing to the Latin translation translator a complete misunderstanding of the passage, because the entire passage is that you know the the number. The the uh, the meaning of the the name of the beast will be revealed when the uh, fulfillment is is imminent. Also, what would it mean to see the name? The name was seen late in Domitian's reign, uh, and a name is not really seen. It's a it's a it's a word. It's a you know. Um, and I think the reason Robinson did that, the uh, the work on the uh, use of the passive, uh, the use of the Topic accusative with a passive has been something that uh, Latin linguists have been doing research on just in the last two or three decades. So this is not something he would have been, he would not have been familiar with, with that line of research. Um, mm -hmm. Now, older scholars than him have noted that us and um are often interchangeable, that copyists would often put um for us. And he dismissed that. I think, um, I think that was really, uh, uh, not not really something that can just be dismissed because it you know i i give examples in my book of where the us and um are, are interchanged right. in certain writers okay um with regard to irenaeus in this translation that he was the one who was seen in uh uh 
Ecclesiastical History, Book 5, uh, Chapter 30. Are you aware of any reputable English translation that follows your reading, he was seen? Um, no, however, uh, obviously scholars Sorry, have ben. discussed it. Yeah, um, obviously scholars have discussed it. Um, but in terms of actual translations of Ire Irenaeus, I would say not yet, not yet. And the reason I say not yet is because uh, Oxford University Press are preparing a new translation of Irenaeus. Um, John Baer is doing that. And I know that he believes uh, that, uh, that John is a subject there. So that argument works now, but it won't work much longer. Uh, there will be, will be a, a, tr a new translation that has John as a subject. Okay, fair enough. Or will at least okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, did I cut you off? Go ahead. No, 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 you're good. Okay. Um, you gave a list of uh, Irenaeus scholars and uh, Johannine scholars and so forth that affirmed the he reading in that section. Yet I noticed that the first uh, proponent was Johann Betstein in 1751. Uh, why is it that it took 1,600 years to see this revisionist history, especially in light of the fact that these church fathers were native Greek speakers? Okay, well, in fact, I would disagree there because um, the passage is not, is not discussed uh, by any church father or by any writer until uh, modern times. And um, I think there's a couple of reasons why it uh, uh, it was assumed that, that the vision was a subject. Of course, the most important one, the most significant one, is that Eusebius himself uh, uh, understood it that way. So that, you know, that kind of produced the default interpretation of it. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of scholars on there that are not preterist. I mean, that... Uh, the second uh, person on that list was, was one of the greatest Greek scholars. Like I said, his, his book was a treasury of Greek uh, quotations from Homeric times to uh, Byzantine times. Um, okay. But, um, you know, it took a, you know, it... Uh, I also think the second reason why that passage is, uh, has, has not been understood correctly is because the context to which Irenaeus was alluding, uh, he talks early on in the passage about the those who saw John face to face testified that the number was 666 and not 616. And, uh, you know, as at the beginning, the verb of seeing uh, those who saw John face to face. And uh, what does that mean? When was John seen? Who are these people? Well, we have to go elsewhere in Irenaeus's work where he says that the elders, he talks about the elders who saw John, the elders who convened or gathered to John. And he talks about how, um, how uh, he, John spoke to them about the times of the kingdom, uh, the millennium, and um, etc. And so, you know, the, the Eusebius didn't mention that tradition, but you find it all over the place, whether the elders or the bishops of Asia or Paul's companions came to John and they asked him to write a gospel. And, um, and when was that place? There are medieval documents that place it 65 years after the ascension. Some mentioned Domitian. So they would have known this tradition. The original writers would have known this tradition. But we've lost it because um, we have to go to, you know, it, it's, it's preserved in the Moratorium Fragment and, and some other writings have not been known for very long. But had they known that tradition, they would have immediately recognized that, that he, that that Irenaeus was alluding to when, when the elders, when the bishops of Asia came to John and saw him. Okay. Well, uh, it's like we're out of time. yeah. Um, all right. Let's. Uh, I'll reset the clock and uh, if I can. Yeah, I'm gonna have to move that so I can get to it. Okay. So ten minutes for you, Dean, and this will be your time for Q and A. Or uh, yeah, Q and A. Yeah. So uh, my question is. Uh, why does Eusebius place, place John's exile uh, in the context of a persecution of Roman aristocrats? Uh, John was neither an aristocrat nor, uh, nor a, um, you know, a resident of Rome. 
And the Roman historians, uh, Dio Cassius and, and um, Suetonius, uh, when we actually read them, they say that, Tertulli, uh, that uh, Domitian persecuted these with either exile or death because he wanted to, um, to uh, basically grab all their estates because he was running out of money. So, uh, you know, how does John end up uh, in that situation? Well, uh, to this, I'll just reply that when Dio Cassius and Suetonius and others mentioned the, um, the concept of exile and banishment under the reign of Domitian, yes, they do refer to the uh, aristocrats and the nobility. However, it does not therefore follow that it's only the nobility and the aristocrats who were banished by Domitian. Now, uh, uh, the key example of that would be Flavia Domitilla. Now, she herself was uh, nobility. Um, however, the reason for which she was um, exiled was that she was, um, uh, was for her, quote, uh, atheism and for her Jewish beliefs. That is why she was exiled. Her husband was murdered and she was exiled. So um, to say that Roman historians would mark, um, that they would decide to mark the, the, or the uh, bourgeois, the, uh, what's the word, the nobility and so forth, that doesn't mean that only the nobility were marked as, um, uh, exiled. And I think a classic example of that would be uh, uh, Domitilla, and, and she fits in with um, uh, John's exile as well. Okay. Um, well, you know, Domitilla was a cousin of the emperor. She was one of the most leading distinguished women in Rome. Her husband was a senator. Um, the historians that, that Eusebius quotes actually says, you know, the illustrious men at Rome. Um, Domitilla herself, as well as the other exiles of Domitian, were sent to the Tyrrhenian Sea, which is the sea between Sicily and Italy, off the west coast of Italy. None of them were sent, uh, according to the Roman historians, to um, to Patmos or to to the Greek islands. Um, so it just seems that you know, and and the Roman historians say that that Domitian came up with any pretext whatsoever. And one of the pretexts was atheism, which, you know, some scholars say refers to um, Jewish proselytes. I think most probably say it refers to Christ Christianity, profession of Christianity. But, um, you know, there is, uh, it was one pretext of, among many. Another pretext was uh, one, of the, one of the people that fought in the gladiator arena. arena and uh, mm -hmm. others had other pretexts. Um, but these were all just pretexts. There's no evidence that Domitian targeted Christians as Christians. And the Roman historians that Eusebius himself quotes only, only speak about the um, aristocratic uh, Romans. And the reason that they give persecution is also only related to the fact that they were aristocrats. It was to, to, um, uh, to uh, seize their estates. So I'm not, again, I'm not really seeing how that is a good fit for John's. Um, sure, but okay, also, let, me, gonna, uh, cite you from, uh, let me cite to you from G.K. Beale. G.K. Beale in his massive commentary on Revelation says this on page eight, quote, some argue that these two were not necessarily Christians, but this is beside the point. This historical evidence demonstrates that religion could result in execution or exile. Craig Blomberg from Pentecost, uh, Pentecost to Patmos writes this, quote, John's brief exile on the island of Patmos, Revelation 1-9, fits the mid-90s well, whereas there is no evidence of Christians being banished from their homelands by the government prior to this day. So it seems to me that the best evidence for a diminished or a an exile or banishment based on religious beliefs would be under Domitian, not under Nero. So it seems beside the point that you would say, um, uh, on the one hand, 
Uh, Domitian only banished the aristocracy. Well, well, of course, Suetonius and Dio Cassius would focus on the aristocrats. But uh, Beale and uh, Blomberg's point is that this is the first case where we have specifically a religious reason for which someone would be exiled and banished. And adding on to that, uh, that they were uh, both, uh, that edict was rescinded after the death of Domitian and into the reign of Nerva. This seems to fit like a hand in a glove that, that the uh, banishment and exile uh, seem to fit so well together. All right, well, I mean, it seems to me that the Roman historians that Eusebius is relying upon are, are all saying that, you know, it wasn't just an indiscriminate, let's target Christians, it was let's target the aristocracy and use any pretext whatsoever, uh, one of which was atheism and, and um, uh, et cetera. So, you know, I, I mean, I've already made that point, but um, I just want to reiterate. But uh, you mentioned that, you know, those historians state that Nero, uh, sorry, that uh, Nerva restored those um, exiles after the death of Domitian. And yet Tertullian and Hegesippus, who were two of the, the only two ecclesiastical sources that Eusebius used, both stated that Domitian persecuted the Christians for a very short time and that he himself restored the exiles. So again, we've got a disagreement with the Roman historians, um, if you accept that the, this is referring to the same events, and neither Hegesippus nor Tertullian actually state that this took place during that persecution of the Roman aristocracy in the 90s. How would you respond to the fact that both of those writers say that Domitian himself brought an end to the persecution and restored the, the Christian exiles? Well, I would, I would take this to be divergent historical traditions. Um, I mean, we see this throughout the church fathers. We see this, as I pointed out, with Philip Schaff with regard to the Nicolaitans. We see um, repeated uh, divergent historical traditions. And, and to build a strong case off of um, whether it was Domitian who brought these people back or it was Nerva, after the assassination of Domitian, and then the the exile and banishment was uh, rescinded. Um, whether this was AD 95 or the late 90s or whatever, um, or it was 96 AD under Nerva, I I see the the historical divergence between the fathers and the, uh, the Roman historians, but I. I don't see how this builds a powerful abductive differential case for the Neronian uh, date or for uh, uh, the book of Revelation. So I, I see your point. I, I just don't see how this gives us good abductive grounds as to why pointing out a discrepancy would therefore uh, prove the Neronian date for Revelation. Well, I guess I would say that the, the discrepancy, the divergence, is simply because Hegesippus and Tertullian weren't speaking about the persecution that Eusebius tries to place John's exile within the context of. Um, that the, the issue here is is that Eusebius has basically created this placement of John in that, in that context, um, mm. for which there's no evidence anywhere else. All right, time up. Oh, you've got another minute. Oh, right, okay. Um, yeah, uh, at this point, with just a minute, I think uh, I think I'll end it there then. Okay. But, uh, just to, yeah, just to say, just to say, there's no evidence that uh, John was placed in that that persecution. His exile was placed in that persecution until Eusebius comes along. Dean, one thing we could do is uh, do another 10 minutes apiece if you want. Yeah, well, it, if oh, you guys want to do that. Yeah, if you want to do That'll another. Okay. Well, let me get 10 minutes up on the board. I think this will be good for the audience as well. Uh, and then. Yeah, that would be great. So, okay. So, yeah. so this will be, James, you'll have the next 10 minutes. Well, let me get that switched over so we can see it. And I'll, whenever you're ready, I'll start the clock. 
All right, so um, in Ecclesiastical History, Book 5, Chapter 8, Eusebius begins and ends that chapter with these words, quote, Irenaeus speaks about the apocalypse of John, end quote, and then he ends it with, quote, these things are written by the aforesaid about the apocalypse. So my question is, why would we think that the author was referring to John in section when Eusebius tells us explicitly, both at the beginning and the end, in the context, that this is referring to the apocalypse? So um, I'm sorry, I thought we were going to have a rebuttal time, but is this question cross examination? Yeah, I thought Did we were going to do another now? 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay, all right, great. All right. So, um, Joshua, could you bring up my PowerPoint? This is, I had my mic muted too. This is where it gets a little bit outside of my expertise because I'm not, I'm not the best host. Every, I mean, people are saying the moderator needs to fix the clock. The moderator needs to do this. I'm just telling you guys I'm doing the best I can. Okay, so, and I'll make up for that time for you, but I want to see if I can get James on here in the screen as well. We might be able to split no, okay. all ahead. three. I'm not sure if we, okay. oh, there we go. Hey, look at that. Yeah. Yeah, would it, be, would it be okay if we uh, bump the clock back to 10 minutes just so we're not losing time? That'll work. Cool. So did that, did that question make sense? Right, okay. Yeah, yeah, I've got it. Yeah, I've got it. So, um, gotcha. all right, great. So, yeah, let's discuss Irenaeus then. It's good. We've got some time to do that. Um, so, yeah, Eusebius does introduce the quotation from Irenaeus with a discussion of uh, Revelation. A book, of course, he didn't uh, think should be in the canon of scripture. But um, I would say that's kind of irrelevant because we know how Eusebius understands the passage. But in the context of Irenaeus, um, it's not, this is the first mention of the apocalyptic vision itself. The context is actually the number 666 and whether. Um, two things. Number one, whether the correct reading is 616 or 666. And the second thing is what the meaning of the 666 is. And uh, this is the whole argument. Yeah, uh, so he says, you know, those, those guys who saw John face to face, they say that the number 66. So he, he must have discussed it with them, right? Um, and elsewhere, he says that the elders discussed with John. The, um, the millennial kingdom, the, the, the days of the kingdom. And, um, and then he moves on to the meaning of, and this is all, you know, this is all preserved in the Latin, the, um, the context of Irenaeus. He goes on to the meaning of 666. What can it mean? And he gives some ideas, you know, maybe it means, you know, the, the, the Latin man, or maybe it means, you know, I think it's Titan or something. He says, well, you know, these are all speculations and uh he says the fact is we're not going to know until the fulfillment until the beast is actually about to you know enter world history and he says it can't be now it can't be now because um if it if it was uh, imminent then um then john the one who saw the apocalyptic vision or at least this is my take right uh, uh he would have he would have declared it he would have announced it he would have made it known because, and you know, here's where we get to the, to the, um, to the crux of the issue. But like I said, I'm going to give you my take. Because he was seen by the elders late in Domitian's reign, and that's nearly our generation. Um, so the idea is like, you know, um, you know, if he, you know, the argument is like he would have told me if he was coming to stay with us because I only spoke with him yesterday. John would have told us the the uh, meaning of the name. If it's about to happen because he was seen nearly in our time now according to the standard view 
Irenaeus' argument, and it's only the last bit that is affected, right? The, the context is the same no matter what. But uh, it would be this one um, B, right, on here. So can you all see this? So if it needed to be known now, John would have revealed the Antichrist name because John saw the apocalyptic vision very recently. So, I mean, that works, right? I don't, I don't think it's as, as clear because uh, the emphasis is on John. Um, but that argument would be, you know, if the Antichrist name needed to be known right now, John would have revealed it because he spoke to these guys. He discussed all of this when he was seen by them nearly in our time. So that's how I would take um, the meaning. Um, um, is my PowerPoint not showing? Uh, no, it's not right now. I um, exited out of it for some reason. Okay. Okay, is it okay if I move on to another question? Yeah, let's, but let, we need to, yeah, let's keep the question going. We've had six, uh, four minutes for one question. So, James, let's, uh, what's your next okay. question? All right, so, yeah, so the beginning and the end of this chapter is focused on the apocalypse. Now, Dean, you just said that the focus is on John and recording whether it was the 616, the 666. Uh, interestingly, for preterists, um, none of these. Uh, reference are thought to be Nero. And I know that's not a point for you because you're not a preterist, but uh, John gives three different options and says, or excuse me, Irenaeus gives three different options. None of them are Nero. Uh, however, the nearest antecedent is the apocalypse. I think we would both agree with that, grammatically speaking. I don't know if there's a, de a debate for that. But moreover, the nearest antecedent foreseen, uh, Heorathe, is um, specifically who saw the apocalypse, which is John. So I don't know why we would go all the way back. I think we're seeing a pattern. Um, the nearest antecedent for it was not seen is not the nearest antecedent, which is the apocalypse. It's the next nearest antecedent, which was John. And then seen, we should interpret that through the elders seeing John face to face at the beginning of the chapter, rather than in the previous clause, who saw the apocalypse, which is the revelation, as you know. Um, that, that, that term, horao, is used seven times, and the term seen is used somewhere around 50 times in the book of Revelation. So to interpret this through the grid of... Um, uh, this all being about John, when the beginning and ending of the chapter is about the apocalypse, the antecedent is the apocalypse, uh, what is seen is the apocalypse. Um, how do you respond to that? What's, I, I, I guess, yeah. how do you see the, the burden being John himself? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, I'll reiterate that the, the context is not about the revelation of John. That's the context in Eusebius, not the context in, in Irenaeus. The context is in Irenaeus is the number 666 and the meaning of the name. Um, and um, the, the um, Chase, uh, one of the scholars I mentioned who was a distinguished classicist, pointed out that John is emphatically placed in the, in the original Greek. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a very literal translation. Um, so if it were meant to be plainly uh, announced in our time, by that one, it would have been announced, who also saw the apocalyptic vision for, um, for he was seen, but it was seen. So John is emphatically, did you notice it's um, by that one, it would have been declared. Now, in our English translations, we often see, you know, it would have been, it would have been announced by him who saw the apocalyptic vision. But we've got, uh, we've got the emphatic uh, placement of John first in the sentence. By that one, it would have been declared, who also saw the apocalyptic vision. Uh, and we have the demonstrative pronoun, akainu. So, um, you know, we've got a double emphasis upon John. By that one, it would have been announced, who also saw the apocalyptic vision, for he was seen. The, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, by that one who, uh, by that one it would have been 
announced, who also saw the apocalyptic vision, the who also saw the apocalyptic vision is simply emphasizing John's ability That's to it. interpret the thing. Um, but so, it's, so it's paradigmatic. The, What's yeah, that? the grammar, the use of a kenu, um, you're saying that there's an emphasis on John, whereas I'm arguing it's that a the contract, yeah, yeah, right, I got you. In, okay. in Greek, um, yeah, yeah, double, double emphasis by the emphatic placement of okay. John first in the sentence by that one, and okay. also by the demonstrative of kind. Okay. All right. Uh, do you believe that Nero had Peter and, according to yes. First Woman Five, uh, apologetic and Five to Julian? Okay. Do you believe that Nero banished John to Patmos? Yes. Okay. Now, Paul was a Roman citizen. Um, Peter, too, and was crucified. Why is John given light treatment? Why is John given light treatment? Well, um, as I mentioned before, uh, it would appear that uh, they did try killing him, right, with the boiling oil, and that that failed, and that the uh, punishment for uh, magic was exile. So uh, I assume that, you know, they tried killing him. They were perhaps scared, like the Syriac uh, act, uh, history of John says that kind of Nero freaked out because an angel appeared to him in a dream and so he exiled him to, to Patmos. Um, but at least from the early Christian perspective, of course, um, you know, they could all be completely wrong. But, um, uh, okay. Well, that's time. Exile would have followed on from the failed attempt to execution. That's what I'm saying. Perfect. Okay. And, uh, Dean, I'm going to turn it over to you. You've got 10 minutes for your second round of cross examination. All righty. All right. Um, So, Victorinus, Victorinus uh, says that John grew old on Patmos. So, um, do you accept that Victorinus is not evidence for Eusebius' view that John was exiled, placed, placed into exile, sentenced to exile late in Domitian's reign? Um, let me make sure I'm getting this correctly. So, uh, Victorinus claims in his commentary that John grew old um, yep. on Patmos, and yep. um, and so therefore he is at odds with Eusebius. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I guess I would ask the question when. Um, and, and this is honestly a question. Um, and I'm not trying to trap you or anything either. Uh, when does Victorinus say that John was banished? And when does Eusebius say that John was banished? I, I don't know the answer to those questions. I don't know if they give a date for when he was banished. So if, okay. for example, John was banished in the early 80s and uh, was there for a dozen years or so, I could see that that would be consonant with Eusebius um, and with Victorinus. Uh, he grew old at that time. Am I missing okay, the, yeah. the um, question, though? He, well, um, Eusebius, uh, he placed it in the context of the persecution of the nobility, and that is dated to, to the early 90s. Okay, I got you. All right, so, so yeah. at most he would have had a five-year stint on the Patmos Island. Uh, where I think two or three. I Victor. think two or three. I think. Um, okay. I think. Yeah. I think Domitilla and them were. I think around ninety-four, unless I'm mistaken. Okay, I had ninety-five, but no, no matter. Okay, so um, the idea that it was they were only there for a few years, whereas Victorinus said, "What's what's the exact quote, Dean?" That he grew old. Yeah. Um. So. Uh. Yeah. I've got it here. Uh, when John said these things, he was in the island of Patmos, 
condemned to the mines by Caesar Domitian. There he saw the apocalypse, and when at length, grown old, he thought that he should receive his release by suffering, uh, a Domitian being killed, he was liberated. Okay, so to that I would just say um, that we're, we're packing a lot of uh, interpretation into that expression, grown old. Does this mean that it's in the present sense of that he had continued to grow old while he was on the island? Um, since Domitian's reign was only from 81 to 95, um, what, uh, 14 years? If Even, even if we put uh, Victorinus at the beginning in the 80s and he grew old over that time, um, adding 14 years to a man who is very old, I, I see how that would um, be at odds with Eusebius. I mean, whether it's three years at the end of Domitian's reign or let's say 12 years throughout Domitian's reign, I think the point is, is they are saying that he grew old. He was, he was an old man by the end of it. I mean, certainly by the time of AD 95, uh, John would have been a very old man. So I, I again, I, I, I see your point. I see that there is a discrepancy in the traditions. And I, I think in chapters one through uh, five of your book, you, you make that case for the different uh, Johns, John of Zebedee, um, uh, uh, Ha, Pre Presbyteros, Ioannes, the Elder John, and the Seer John. And, um, and you're trying to show divergent traditions to show that these are different people. But it seems to me that this doesn't demonstrate um, what you're trying to pack into it, that, that therefore it shows that they're at odds and we can't trust their testimony if, if I'm reading you or uh, interpreting you correctly, but I might not be. I don't know. I think um, I think I'm just trying to show that Eusebius is really the first writer who placed John's exile, because you know we have this idea that you know, and it's a popular idea that all of the early Christians placed John's exile, you know, in the in in um, in this persecution of Domitian in the 90s, and in fact Eusebius is the first one to do that. So really, my idea is just to show that even even Victorinus, who's put forward as a as a uh, as a name for the you know for the late date doesn't really you know there's some question whether he whether he is more of a more of evidence for say john's exile in the 80s um rather than well, either rather way than if it was in the 80s or in 95 um it would still be demission yeah um though uh, I guess I could I mean, say, well, the moratorium fragment is. Uh, I could say the moratorium fragment is evidence for an early, you know, Neronian date, but I'm still going to use it because it's Neronian. Oh, I wouldn't do that because yeah, that I, I'm arguing for. No, the, the moratorium Sorry, think, fragment is for Nero, would put it into Claudius. I mean, I mean, Paul's letters that are mentioned in the moratorium fragment. Are Galatians, which dates to AD 48 and 49, First Thessalonians, which dates firmly to AD 50. I mean, these are within the seven core Pauline corpus that even uh, critics agree with. And this would be long before uh, the Neronian date. So I, I, well, I don't see you would appeal to these because this is this is a dozen years before Nero. And these seven churches uh, to which the Muratorian fragment appeals, uh, none of these are in the right order. They're not even in the right order. Uh, so I, I, I don't see why we have divergent historical texts. And from this, we can infer uh, that, oh, it couldn't have been Domitian when it puts us all the way back into the time of Claudius. I, I just, I do not see that as, as positive. Yeah, well, some people would say, you know, that all that the moratorium fragment requires is that um, Paul wrote the last of his letters after Revelation, which would, you know, bring it up to the early 60s. Um, but I think Mark, Mark Hitchcock is correct that really, you know, uh, Kenneth Gentry shouldn't have used that argument since he's arguing for 65. 
But yeah. to say, you know, for the late date, the late date, um, you know, uh, if Victor Ines is saying that, you know, um, John saw these things on Patmos, uh, and then having grown old, he he got released. That that seems to suggest that the exile and even the seeing of the vision, uh, you know, were, were ten maybe more years before the, the the typical late date. And I think it also uh, shows. Uh, well, let me put it this way: Do you you know you have Vic? You know, Victorinus is Domitianic, maybe not late Domitianic, but Domitianic. Who, what unambiguous writer before Eusebius places John's exile and the apocalyptic vision? When I say unambiguous, I mean there's no scholars, um, no leading world renowned scholars who, who disagree over the interpretation. Uh, place John's exile late or revelation late in Domitian's reign. Just, just. A couple well, of I, I, one or two yeah, I think, uh, early Christian sources before yeah. you see it. Sure. Okay. So that brings me back to what you said before. Is you said that Eusebius is um, you said this quote the Domitianic date is not established until Eusebius. Eusebius follows Victorinus. Okay, but in Book Three and Book Five, Eusebius cites verbatim from Irenaeus. Now, the way you set up that question, Dean, I, I don't think was fair. You said, um, what uh, source do you know? I can't, I'm not going to get your verbiage right. Bear with me. What source um, before Eusebius or Victorinus uh, do zero scholars debate? And no, I would no, just not say, zero. Not zero. I said leading, leading scholars. Not like I'm not saying, you know, you can find one over there in left field. I'm saying, you know, a, a source that leading world-renowned scholars don't disagree on. Okay, I, I'm saying I'm saying Irenaeus, and I'm saying they are going to debate everything. They are going to debate everything. You, you are an academic. You know the, the expression, publish or perish. Um, scholars are going to debate everything, especially with the church fathers. You know that. So um, I, I just think that's an extraordinary burden of proof that, that you're uh, asking me to shoulder when the text itself is quite clear okay. uh, in my just one clear, just one clear I, ancient Christian writer that, that taught the, the late Domitianic uh, place of revelation. That's just one clear no real disagreement so let's let's take this and carry it over into our 10 minute open discussion because we this will transition out yep. of the cross examination to the open discussion maybe we can start out right. with uh, that point there that you just brought up Dean and then continue the conversation and go from there okay oh, yes one more time Dean go ahead Did, can you say that one more time your question Oh, sure, yeah. Um, I was just saying, you know, it's just one generally considered unambiguous statement. Um, and I appreciate that you didn't mention, like, you know, Origen in this. You know, Origen said that John was exiled by the king of the Romans. And you'll be surprised the number of books that, uh, and commentaries that cite Origen as evidence for the late day. <laughs> so I appreciate that. But I'm just saying, um, I just, I'm just looking for just one... Uh, or two unambiguous sources before Eusebius who placed John's exile and or revelation uh, late in Domitian's reign. Okay. And perhaps, um, perhaps the answer is, and perhaps James, to be fair, the answer is, well, Irenaeus, I don't consider him ambiguous. And, and that's fine, I'll accept that. I, I, I won't agree, but you know, if that's your answer, I can accept sure. it. Um, well, Irenaeus, as cited by Eusebius um, twice in the Greek is being uh, demonstrated to show that he believed in uh, the Domitianic date at the end of his reign. And again, yeah. I have to point out that to say that um, what is a source on which uh, reputable, serious scholars do not debate 
come on, you, you know, you know more than that. To say that uh, well, well, serious you know, guys debate. Well, I'm, you know, I'm just saying, like, no one, no one debates whether Victor Ina said that John was exiled in Domitian's reign. But you know, with Irenaeus, no you've got that. you know, world-renowned. No you've got that. disagreement. What's that? No one debates that. No one questions whether Victorinus placed uh, John's exile in Domitian's reign because it's clear. Um, but when you've got an ancient Latin translation that, that diverges from Eusebius, and you've got you've got you know very renowned experts of the Greek language that disagree as to the subject of the um, verb in Irenaeus, you know that I think could justly be considered ambiguous because there is. You know, I mean, you've got a translation that predates probably Eusebius by 150 years, and you've got, um, I say probably, because we don't know when, when it was written. It might have been contemporaneous yeah. with Eusebius, but that's the, that's the high end of the, of the estimates. But, um, the, um, you know, there are recognized, what I'm saying is there are recognized issues with that. This isn't just, you know, one or two crazy scholars um, Sure. you know coming out but is there any other is there any other sort you know is there any are there any sources that um kind of clearly everyone agrees everyone says yeah there's not an issue here there's no ancient translations that disagree there's no renowned scholars that have have a different take is there any sources before eusebius that placed john's exile his sentence into exile and or his seeing of the apocalyptic vision late in Domitian's reign? Well, I feel like we're running into a kind of a circle here. Um, yeah. What I'm doing here is that that is an extraordinary burden of proof. And okay. I'm arguing that the source itself, it, having, which would you rather have? One very good source in close proximity to the author himself, or would you rather have a bunch of uh, in my estimation, um, not cogent, inferential arguments. And I, as I said, I think one of the big aspects of this debate is that you're arguing from inferential data and differences of um, historical uh, tradition, divergences, and I'm arguing from not just that, because we haven't even gotten to the internal evidence, but I, I believe in abductive reasoning and I believe in inferential arguments, but but it seems to me that your case is primarily on inferential data and divergences of um, historical tradition. And I, um, it seems to me that, that setting up the question in such a way to give it such a, um, a, 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 a difficult burden of proof isn't the way to go about it. Uh, if I could switch over, um, I would like to see, we haven't gotten to the internal evidence, and I would, I had to kind of quickly because I, I didn't have the time clock. I blame it on yeah. Josh. I don't blame <laughs> it on myself. Um, but, good. Uh, huh. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, I was yeah. just wondering, uh, I'll, I'll just read these real quick, uh, Dean. Um, John's yeah. ministry, this would overlap with Paul. I'm sure you're familiar with these. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Polycarp's reference in his letter to the Philippians, chapter 11, that uh, but we of Smyrna had not yet known him. And uh, Laodicea's uh, fast um, rebuilding uh, from the earthquake in AD 60. So uh, you could, any one of those three, um, how would you respond to this? So far, I feel like it's been almost entirely on the external evidence. Yeah, I'm um, sorry, um, you, it cut out. How would I respond to, did you want me to like uh, address one of those first or just? Uh, yeah, you can take yeah. your pick. I just said uh, John's ministry overlapping with Paul and Timothy. Yeah. Um, Polycarp's reference to the church in Smyrna may not have existed. And then Laodicea. And then Laodicea's recovery. So you can, whatever you think, okay. I just want to hear your so, thoughts. Um, yeah, sure. Um, for, for the, uh, you know, why doesn't Timothy, uh, Second Timothy mention John? Um, those who are familiar with my second book or dissertation know that I actually do believe John is mentioned in Second Timothy, but we can't get into that right now. Um, but um, 
So I'm just going to argue this from the point of view that I don't believe that. <laughs> okay, if that's okay. Um, so um, we don't know when Second Timothy was written, right? It could have been. Uh, I've seen estimates as early as 58 uh, in John Robinson's book, like 61 or or 62 to as late as 67, and um, so um, you know, and what it. Paul in Rome, you know, what did he know about what was going on in Ephesus or, or who was there? So I think that's a very difficult kind of argument because you've got to assume so many things about uh, what Paul knew and when John was there and when uh, Second Timothy was written. Well, he mentioned 17 people at the close of his letter. Um, doesn't that seem like a conspicuous silence that he wouldn't mention John, especially with a young leader like Timothy and especially on the precipice of death? Well, um, yeah, one second. Sure. Okay, I'm going to stop the clock here. Yeah, again, that, 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 um, that assumes that, um, that uh, John was, was there and that Paul knew he was there. And, you know, according to all the traditions, you know, Hippolytus, and Tertullian. John was actually exiled from Rome, not from uh, Ephesus. He went to Ephesus after his return from Patmos. So I, again, I don't see that as, even though I do believe John was mentioned, but you know, just kind of taking that off the table. I, I just think it, you know, it uh, requires too much, uh, too many assumptions about when, I mean, you know, Second Timothy could have been written, you know, there's like a six, seven year period of a period of, you know, date range in which it could have been written. So, uh, All right. uh, what about the uh, Laodicean argument that there was the earthquake, according to Colin J. Hemer, and the earthquake just destroyed in AD 60, and yet by AD 65, uh, Jesus can say of that church in Revelation 3.17, uh, I am rich, I am in need of nothing. How could they have, have uh, been claiming that five years into a 20-year uh, rebuilding project? Yeah, um, so first of all, I would say that it wasn't a 20-year rebuilding project. Uh, I believe that uh, comes from Mark possibly comes from Mark Hitchcock's um, dissertation, though I've seen it, I'm, I'm not sure if I've seen it anywhere else, you might have seen it somewhere else. But this is all based on yeah, the fact the, that the stadium... The uh, Cymbeline or Oracles uh, 4.107. Yeah, um, so this is all based upon the idea because the stadium was built, a stadium was built in uh, around 79, I think, but, you know, building projects did continue. Pompeii was destroyed by an earth earthquake in 62 and it hadn't even been fully uh, repaired when it was uh, buried in volcanic ash in in uh, was it 68 I uh, can't remember 70 <laughs> sorry 70 uh, 79 I'm a, okay. Robert, I'm a I should know it um, but um, the um, uh, you know Tacitus says that they were able to recover themselves without any help from the imperial treasury. So usually what would happen is the Romans would would send someone for a couple of years, for two years, and they would oversee the uh, distribution of aid to the to the town. But for whatever reason, Laodicea did not get the imperial um, aid. And, uh, you know, they continued to be a town. They continued to be self-supporting. Uh, they continued the economic activity, so okay. uh, I don't, I don't see, you know, the fact that they didn't have aid from the imperial treasury would suggest that there was no need for it, that they didn't qualify. Um, okay. Some people say they refused it. I don't know. We don't know. All right. Well, that's but, time uh, for our. That's time for the open discussion. Okay. Let's cut to our closing statements. We've got five minutes each, and then audience, we're going to open it up to you for your questions, where you can call in. And when we get to the end of uh, the five-minute closing statements, I'll put that number up on the screen for you. And you can also click the link to the live stream in the live stream description in YouTube or Facebook or whatever platform you're watching from. 
and you could join the live stream that way if you want to interact directly and have your face on the live stream. That's cool too. So anyways, uh, James, you'll be up first and I'm going to turn it over to you for your five minute closing statement whenever you're ready. Great. Well, I just wanted to uh, thank Dr. Okay. Uh, security <laughs> discussion here and uh, grateful for him and for uh, being able to have a good back and forth. I think, as I pointed out throughout this debate, that one of the key differences is the inferential versus the referential arguments. And one of the things we saw in Dr. Furlong's presentation um, from Irenaeus, from Clement of Alexandria, from the Acts of John, and so forth, is that he was trying to demonstrate that there were difficulties in these um, texts which showed that there was too much time uh, being put forth in between the events in question, which are inferences. And I think inferential reasoning and abductive reasoning is fair. However, I do not believe that it overthrows the clear, explicit references that we saw. If you remember in my opening statement, I concluded with this, that the Domitianic date is held by the scholarly consensus as the only explicit references for the first 400 years held by closest extant witnesses, which would be Irenaeus. It was held by the first extant commentary, which is Victorinus, and it was held by Christian historian Eusebius, and it fits with the internal evidence. Now, as far as I could see, um, the closest that we came to was to try and disprove the evidence from Irenaeus or Victorinus or Eusebius or Jerome or the internal evidence. The best we saw on the other side was simply that um, there are inferential arguments that there was too much time, that these traditions don't fit with each other. And yet, when we look to the church fathers and ancient history, we are going to see a plethora, a myriad of, of, of difficulties with this uh, uh, historical tradition. Um, so I, I just simply do not think that those arguments are able to overthrow the arguments that that I laid out here. Now, all that is to say, I don't I don't mean to say that uh, Dr. Furlong's case was completely vacuous. I think he makes good points. Um, there's difficulties, but just because there's difficulties, this it does not follow that therefore the Neronian date is true. What I would like to close with is that when you're making uh, as far as historical methodology is concerned. You want to pick the view that has the most explanatory power and the most explanatory scope. So if you were to think of being in a, a court of law in a murder case and you had 20 bits of evidence, you want to pick the view that can explain the scope, the most amount of data, so maybe 17 out of the 20 bits of data. And you want to have the view that has the most explanatory power, that it can explain those bits of data the most uh, cogently or effectively. And so you want the most explanatory power, the things that the best, and the most explanatory scope. And it seems to me that what we see here is that the the view that has the most explanatory power and scope is the Domitianic date. We can squabble over whether Victorinus was in the early late 80s or the 90s or Eusebius. Um, uh, when, when was uh, John uh, uh, removed back from the island of Patmos? And there's bits of data that are going to be difficult to explain on any view. My point is that the view that has the most explanatory power is the date of the Domitianic uh, date of Revelation. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you for that, James. And let me get 
Dean back up on the screen, and then you'll have your five minutes for your closing statement. And again, audience, we're just about to get to the point that you're going to be able to be involved. So uh, get that number down uh, if you want to get a call in. That's 816 866 And obviously, it'll be first come, first serve. Those who want to join the live stream will be uh, given first priority. And then it'll go to the calls coming in and then to the questions that are typed in. So anyways, thank you for that, James Dean. We'll turn it over to you. I think we've got you muted. Challenges. I, okay, am I on? Okay, you can hear me now. Yep. Yeah. So I appreciate I appreciate the debate. Appreciate James. Uh, thank him for the for the uh, back and forth and the discussion. It's been great. Um, this is my first debate, but uh, it's been enjoyable. Sometimes you see people getting very mad at each other on online debates. So this is this is good. Um, I don't believe. It's a matter of inferential versus referential. I think it's a matter that we really don't have a whole lot of information in the first 400 years. And um, we have uh, a lack of, of you know, uh, ref actual explicit, you know, John was exiled uh, here and, you know, at this point. What we do have, though, is we have a number of sources which all seem to paint the same picture. This is, yeah, this is inferential evidence because where is you know it's not like uh you have a, a ton of writers saying that that this all happened in domitian domitian's reign you actually have irenaeus and victorinus uh potentially um and irenaeus if you interpret it that way you have to uh, go against the ancient latin translator so uh and i also think it, it, you have to go against the context of the passage so um you know you have one explicit for for domitian in, in victorinus you have uh, one explicit for a very early date in the Moratorian canon. And, uh, and then you have, have the other sources, which all seem to have the same tradition, the same idea of a John who was uh, sent into exile and uh, in Nero's reign and uh, came back to Asia, traveled around, for probably for decades, uh, in which uh, time this story of the of the young robber captain uh, took place, and this doesn't need to have happened right away, right? This doesn't need to have happened as soon as he got back to Asia Minor. This could have happened in the 80s. This could have happened in 85, 90, when John was still an old man, but he hadn't lost the rigor uh, and his ability to to uh, ride horses and, and pursue young people. Uh, so. Um, is it inferential? Yes, but it's not, it's not irrelevant. Uh, these all seem to, the Acts of John and, uh, and Clement and Tertullian all seem to assume a long period of time after John's return from Patmos in which he visited all seven churches, ordained elders. And, uh, and according to the tradition of Jerome, he, uh, he was unable or to, to move in his extreme old age after decades of ministry. Now, I never did deny that Jerome held to the late date. He does. But that doesn't mean that he's not useful for historical evidence when he quotes other, other people like Tertullian. So in conclusion, there is not a whole lot of explicit evidence. But where, the, where we do have evidence, it all points in one direction and it points to a Neronian exile of John and hence to a Neronian date for the revelation of John. Okay. All right. Well, you've got more time if you if you want to take that, Dean. If not, that's totally fine too. We can uh, turn that over to, for the audience no, Q&A. So. All right, I'm let, it, let me get all of us back up on the screen and we will uh, give you guys a chance in the audience. This is your chance to call in or join the live stream. Let me get that number up on the board for you. Whoop. Okay, so that should be screening, scrolling across here. I'm going to try to speed that up a little bit. It's 816-866-0025, or you can join the live stream. Again, that's going to be in the description box of, of, uh, of your link in Facebook or... Um, 
um, or YouTube or wherever you're watching from. So, okay, now we've got a um, the first comment that I wanted to bring up here. Don says, let me see. Uh, Don Don David Sternmeyer says. This has been a very respectful debate, both by the participants and us in the chat. Why can't they all be this way, Don? I've got to say that I agree with you on that so far. This has been a very good debate, very cordial, and um, there's been good points that have been brought up as well. So thank you guys for doing that. Now, Vladimir has got a point that you bring up here in the quotation from Revelation. He says, I come quickly. Jesus, uh, Jesus speaking here. He says, is this in 65 AD or is it in 98 AD that he's... That, He's expecting to come quickly, or when it was when it was written, I guess. So, Dean, why don't you take the fir the first response to that, and then we'll turn it over to you, James, and get your take on that. Uh, I mean, you know, that's a exegetical question, and honestly, it's not one I've looked into. It's it's uh, it's definitely the strongest argument I think in favor of uh, preterism. Um, but uh, okay. You know, that, that's really as much as I can say. I mean, you know. Okay. James, how, how would you respond to that? Yeah, this, uh, well, there's actually two words. There's the word uh, tachos, and then there's the word agus, which is used for uh, coming quickly and um, uh, things that must soon take place. Now, um, what, what should be pointed out is well, first of all, uh, lexically, the word tachos, this is the word from which uh, we get our modern term tachom uh, tachometer on our uh, car engine. So if you're getting up to two, three, four thousand RPMs, it's referring to the, uh, the rate at which your uh, engine is running. And so it refers to uh, or could be referring to um, speed or quickly. So I would take this to refer to the imminence of Jesus's return. So when Jesus returns, um, when it starts to go down, when he starts to return, it's going to happen quickly. Now, um, if, if one doesn't find that persuasive, let me remind you that in Revelation 1 and in Revelation 22, the same words are used. Hold, I am coming quickly, and uh, the time is near. It's the same language, and this forms what is referred to uh, theologically as an inclusio, an inclusio, a book, so to speak, for Revelation 1 and Revelation 22. And so, however we interpret uh, tachos and egos in this section, it would have to apply not only to um, the beginning of Revelation, which is Jesus' return, but also to the new heavens and new earth in Revelation 22. So this is why uh, many people in a, a polemical sense have said that there are no partial preterists. There are only full preterists. Because to be a consistent preterist, one needs to hold that the entirety of Revelation is quick and is soon. Now, I'm not trying to poke any preterists in the eye, um, but I'm just trying to point out that however you take that, you need to take it in its entirety. So if you want to bite the bullet and say that Jesus uh, came quickly uh, in a temporal sense in AD 95, then you need to think that the entire um, book of Revelation, including the new heavens and new earth of Revelation 21 and 22, also refers to... Um, him coming quickly. Okay. And again, let me just point out, I would just say, I believe it's uh, imminency, that Jesus could return quickly. It's going to happen very fast. Okay. That's a good point. Thanks for that, James. Okay, so I've actually got a question myself, I've, I, or two questions. One, so this is something that we kind of talked about before we went live, and um, the question that I've got for you guys and for the audience as well to consider is, is kind of, uh, why would this be such an important conversation regarding the date of the writing of uh, the book of Revelation. Um, and the reason why this is important to a lot of people, like you just brought up there, James, is is because of the implications that it'll, it'll have on a person's eschatology, whether it's preterism, full, uh, partial preterism, um, futurism, those sorts, of, those sorts of things. So the dating of the book of Revelation seems to me to impact one's eschatology, and it seems like 
uh, in order to have, and this is my own personal opinion, Dean, don't take this personally, but um, it, it seems like there's a theologically motivated position to have an early date. I'm not saying, Dean, you do, because it seems like you still try to hold to a futurist position. Um, and I'm not really sure how that works out with an early date, but um, maybe I just need to study and read more of what you've written on that. But uh, my point is this. I think that um, you know the Roman Catholic Church obviously would have to have an early date for the book of Revelation because of their eschatological views re- regarding the return of Christ and allegorical uh, return of Christ, those sorts of things. And and then when you see the a full preterist position, you see how it impacts the resurrection and those sorts of conversations too. But um, I guess overall, why is this important? Why should it matter to the audience? And why does it why is it so important to you guys? One, to do a whole dissertation on it, and two, to write a book on it and then um, defend it. So Dean, let me get your take first, and then I'll go to you, James. Yeah, well, um, my dissertation was actually on early Johannine traditions, early traditions of John. I started out my research actually as a late data, um, but it just became apparent to me that the early Christians held to the the early date. Um, That's how it all uh, fit together. And uh, why is it important? I mean, in terms of bias, honestly, I see bias in on all sides. I mean, yeah, I mean, Preterists are easy to to target for bias, right? Because they have to have an early day. But I mean, the amount of people who utterly kind of refuse to consider anything other than a late date because they don't want to lose the apologetic value of of the late date against preterism, I would say it's just as just as biased. Yeah. Um, read uh, read Hitchcock's dissertation, and it's all like. You know, it's it's like you know these people attack Irenaeus and like, all this kind of language, which is is uh, you know it's. It, I mean, to me, you know, my view is you lay out all the evidence on the table and you see where it goes. You don't start yeah. with a burden of proof or or, or whatever. Um, in terms of why is it important? Uh, I mean, exegetically, obviously, it's very important. It's not you know. I, I mean, I believe John. Uh, you know, Revelation was intended as a kind of pre-millennial document. Um, but um, for me, I've always been interested in early church history and in the background of the New Testament writings. I think it's part of the puzzle, which which solves a lot of, a lot of issues. Um, obviously, the main focus of, of uh, my research has been on the ancient construction of the ancient identity of John the, the Evangelist. Uh, but it's all part of a wider puzzle, I think, for those who are interested. Obviously, you know, most people are not not going to care when was you know the Gospels when were, when were the Gospels written or who you know who was this who's the author of Hebrews or whatever. But for those who are interested, um, you know, it's uh, it can be it can be an interesting debate. But I don't believe it really affects anything, as say you know, obviously preterist would. Uh, would uh, have a lot more staked on the on the issue. Okay, James, and I'll turn it over to you. How would you answer that? Well, yeah, I, I agree with Dean uh, to a large extent. I think that uh, with regard to uh, preterist interpreters, I think they have a much higher um, stake in the game. That if the late date is true their view is defunct. It is, it's toast. Um, however, I agree with him that late daters and futurists have had kind of a polemical approach in writing about this because they just, they salivate over the idea that if you could demonstrate the, the 95 date, uh, you could knock out the preterist view, which has been so popular in the last couple uh, decades. So I do see it going both ways. Um, However, I would point out that bias doesn't necessarily um, uh, discredit truth. Uh, One can be biased and yet still come to true conclusions. So, um, for example, the illustration I like to give is that uh, if you ask LeBron James's mother, Mrs. James, who is the GOAT? You know, who is the greatest of all time basketball player? And she said, oh, my little boy, LeBron. And you said, well, wouldn't you say that you're biased, Miss James? You know, well, of course she's biased, but she's also true. She's also right, right? So um, 
to have a bias, we need to demonstrate that the bias is affecting a person's ability to discern and and uh, demonstrate truth. Um, <clears throat> beyond that, I think that's the main idea. Beyond that, I think it's important to know the date of New Testament books. I, I'll give a quick example. This isn't the best, but it comes to mind. Um, the book of Galatians, whether it is dated in AD 48, before the Council of Jerusalem, or AD 51, which would be after the Council of Jerusalem, that will affect your ability to interpret Galatians chapter 2 and uh, Acts 15, respectively. Is it that, that Paul rebuked Peter before the council, or is it that Paul rebuked Peter after the council of Jerusalem? And so it'll give you nuance to your, your text and your exegesis. And I think that is very important. So I, I think as an exegete or a, a pastor, a Bible scholar like Dean, um, as we're going through uh, books, uh, part of our, our burden is to do a grammatical historical hermeneutic, which is to get the history as best as we can to, uh, okay. to rightly interpret the uh, passage. Cool. Okay, now this is uh, an, one more question for myself, and then I'll go back to the audience and what you guys have typed in. Uh, or if you want to call in, that's cool too. So, um, so my next question is, you had mentioned Mark Hitchcock's dissertation, which, which I've read. And in his dissertation, he actually says that an early date is, is impossible based on one, one example that he gives because of, uh, the church of Smyrna. He says the church of Smyrna didn't actually exist when it, when it was written. In fact, dissertation a lot, um, maybe you could give a second chance. I don't know if that's even relevant to the conversation, but Dean, what's your take on that? Okay, um, you actually cut out for a lot of that, but um, I, I got that you're asking about Smyrna and uh, Polycarp. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't actually, okay, I could be wrong, but I don't think he mentions that in his dissertation. He does mention it in a book of his that he published, uh, or at least which he had a chapter in. Um, I could be wrong. But, yeah, um, he did. I Actually, I sent a screenshot the, uh, of it. Okay, go ahead. He did, okay. All right, so the uh, the quotation is, uh, Polycarp wrote, but I have neither seen nor heard of any such thing among you in the midst of whom the blessed Paul labored and who are commended in the beginning of his letter, for he boasts of you all. So he boasts of you in all those churches which alone then knew the Lord, but we, that is Smyrna, had not yet known him. So Polycarp claims that uh, that at the time of the writing of the letter to the Philippians, the church in Smyrna didn't exist. So, um, and that is all it says. It doesn't say that the church of Smyrna didn't exist during Paul's lifetime, which is how it's sometimes interpreted. It just says at the time of the writing of Philippians, uh, the church at Smyrna hadn't been founded. So, well, when was Philippians written? Um, traditional date is about 60 uh, to 62. Uh, if you hold to the Caesarean imprisonment, you're gonna push it back 57, 58. If you hold to the Ephesian imprisonment, like I do, you're gonna push it back to 54, 55. Uh, they're the three major options. Um, if we take the traditional view, 60, then you've still got, you know, uh, still got five or six years for for the church to be founded. Um, but, you know, in Acts 19, it does say that the whole of Asia heard the word of God. And Smyrna was the third largest major city, 100,000 people. No church there when the whole of Asia heard. Um, and then you have the life of Polycarp by Pionius, fourth century, uh, which records Paul visiting the, the church um, it's not clear chronologically when, but probably before his second Roman imprisonment. Um, so, you know, putting all of that together, I, I mean, it's not really a conclusive argument because um, even if, you know, even if Acts somehow missed out Smyrna, you know, Smyrna was the exception. All of Asia heard the word, but, you know, they all rejected it in Smyrna. There's no church there. 
life of Pioneers is wrong, um, you still got you know five or six years between when Philippians was written and when uh, an early date of Revelation would have been written. Okay, um, and I'll just so I've got it pulled up here. It's on pages uh, 181 and 182 of his dissertation okay. un- under the uh, the section the Church of Smyrna. And under his, his reference in Revelation 2, 8 through 11, he says, The church in Smyrna had been uh, persevering under persecution for some time, yet Polycarp says that Paul praised the Philippian believers um, in all the churches, but that during Paul's ministry, the church of Smyrna did not even exist. And his quotation for that is from, uh, that is from Isbon T. Beckwith, The Apocalypse of John from 1979. But he, he goes on to say this favors the close of the first century as the time of the composition uh, uh, for Revelation. Charles concludes the Church of Smyrna did not exist in 60 to 64 AD at a time when St. Paul was boasting of the Philippians and all the churches. But though Polycarp's letter tells us the Church of Smyrna were, was not founded in 60 to 64 AD, he gives no hint as to when it was founded. Hence, several, several years may have elapsed after the date before it was founded when however we tu- re- we turn to revelation 2 8 through 11 we find that our text presupposes a church poor in wealth but rich in good works with a development of apparently many years to its credit this letter then may have been written in the closing years of uh vespasian 75 to 79 but hardly earlier so anyways that's what uh, part of the quotation there's more on there under that subsection but james um i don't yeah. want to hijack your time so um yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think it's a very good argument. Uh, I, I included it, but I, I was running out of time toward the end of my opening statement. Um, uh, Dean brought up that there are three different ways to um, uh, place Paul's Roman imprisonment. That there is the traditional Roman imprisonment, that there is the Ephesian imprisonment, and then the Caesarean imprisonment. Well, as I uh, cited, um, Homer Kent, Greg, Greg Blomberg, Gordon Fee, all favor the um, uh, Roman imprisonment, house arrest. The Ephesian imprisonment has difficulties because Ephesus was a senatorial province with no imperial praetorium. And um, right now I'm teaching through the book of Philippians uh, for my church. And of course, you remember that Paul is speaking to the entire Praetorian Guard. Number two, Caesarea, Paul claimed that the gospel would spread throughout the whole Praetorian Guard in Philippians 1.13. Yet Caesarea was only a small subsection. Furthermore, when Paul was in Caesarea, his goal was to go to Rome, not to Philippi, according to uh, Philippians 2.24. So, the traditional date of the Roman house arrest seems correct. That would date it to AD 60, and the presence of the Smyrdian church in Revelation 2 seems to have existed for some time where they were under persecution and so forth. And so again, I, I believe this, this is good internal evidence for, um, for the, the late date. If this church had not, um, or this church had been around a long time. And definitely far beyond eighty sixty one. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Now, um, one one thing that I think is important, obviously, Dean, you had, uh, and I, I, I think we'll let's do two more questions, and then we'll we can close it out and go from there. But, but Dean, you had you obviously did your uh, dissertation on the identity of the person of John, um, and and how that relates to the Book of Revelation. I, I'm I'm in James. I heard you earlier in your presentation talk about the uh, different supposed authors, the different Johns that it could have been, um, and I think you listed five. I'm, I might be wrong on that, but Dean, who are you? Who are, who are you proposing actually did write the Book of Revelation? And and uh, and maybe we could get a because I'm not sure I got a clear answer on that. And then James, maybe you could give your take on who the author is also because i'm sure that that's obviously important to the conversation and i missed it so maybe maybe those in the audience did too yeah sure um so uh the basic argument is that the early christians i did identify the uh uh same john as the author of all of the johannine writings 
So uh, I'm not making a distinction between the author of John and the author of Revelation. The uh, the argument is whether the whether John the Evangelist was the Apostle John, the son of Zebedee, and uh, I argued that um, that there's a strong martyrdom martyrdom tradition of for John the son of Zebedee in the ancient church, and that uh, John the Evangelist was was another disciple of Jesus from outside of the twelve. Okay, James. Yeah, I, I hold to the traditional view that is um, propounded by D.A. Carson, Craig Keener, Andreas Kostenberg, um, that it's John of Zebedee that wrote the Gospel, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Revelation. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to get too far afield here, but um, in the first uh, four or five chapters of uh, uh, Dean's book, um, uh, The Identity of John the Evangelist, he argues that um, there's divergent texts and divergent historical traditions, and even allows up to, um, I, I believe you say that there are three different uh, persons. I, I don't believe you land on that, Dean, but you said that there are could be John of Zebedee, who is an author, uh, John of, uh, sorry, John the, uh, I'm blanking out here, John the seer, and then John um, uh, the elder uh, from Apatheus, uh, which is from um, Eusebius book uh, three, uh, chapter 39, that famous passage from Papias. So, um, it seems to me that at some point Occam's razor needs to come in and throughout that section. And I, I, again, I don't want to go too far afield and I also don't want to poke you in the eye and then uh, not let you reply, but it just seemed to me in those early chapters that um, Tertullian, uh, Clement, all these different figures would refer to the disciple or to the apostle or to whomever, but you kept saying it doesn't refer to John of Zebedee and even opened up the idea that there could have been three Johns. And it just seemed to me that the argument, um, it, it favored Occam's razor that if one John could do the trick that we don't need three. And I know the argument's way more developed and this is the, the crux of your work, but I, I just didn't find that persuasive. Joshua, I'm not hearing. I was you. muted. Sorry about that. I was saying, yeah, okay. Dean, let's uh, <laughs> let's give you a chance to respond to that, and then I've got one final question. We'll go from there. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the view is that there's two Johns, uh, but I'm um, not sure where you got the third one. Uh, other than that, uh, I do argue in the second half of the dissertation for um, bring forward some evidence that the early Christians um, identified this second John uh, with um, the John also called Mark. So it might be where the three idea, but there, there is actually two. There's John the Elder and John the Evangelist. Um, sure, yeah, the biggest, certainly the biggest argument and the reason why they were conflated and confounded is because um, the uh, versatility of the title of ap apostle in early Christian writings. Clement of Rome is called an apostle, Jude is called an apostle, Barnabas, Jane, uh, all of the James is called apostles. Uh, it seems to have been given to, Irenaeus seems to suggest that the 70 disciples of Jesus were apostles. So um, uh, that is, you know, that that is, he certainly was called a, an apostle, but um, we have these, uh, traditions. Papias says that there were two Johns who were followers of Jesus. We have the strong martyrdom tradition, far more evidence for the martyrdom than for uh, from the peaceful death of John the Evangelist. The church calendars, Papias himself, uh, Clement of Alexandria suggests that all of the 12 apostles had finished their ministry by the time of Nero, uh, which is a, a passage sometimes brought forward for the early uh, date of revelation but since i don't identify the two i don't i don't use that um 
You've got Chrysostom saying that all of the apostles had died uh, by the time of uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. You have Jesus prophesying the martyrdom of, of both sons of Zebedee. Uh, you know, you will drink my cup, you will be baptized with a baptism I'm baptized with, whereas uh, John the Evangelist was, uh, uh, had an, uh, a natural death. Okay. And all of the ancient writers um, that discuss, uh, discuss that passage, uh, Chrysostom, for example, says that Jesus prophesied a violent death for the, both of the Zebedee brothers. So, yeah. you know, obviously there's, there's a whole lot more, you know, there's, there's chapters and chapters on this, but... Awesome. Okay. Now, which is, uh, yeah, yeah. go ahead, James. I I just wanted to say, uh, Dean, your treatment of that and of the early date, I felt, I found to be very, very well done. And your handling of the church fathers and the Greek and the inferential arguments, I thought were um, excellent. I, I don't agree with them. But I, I thought they were very well done, so I, I just wanted to tip my hat to you there. Um, the idea of uh, a third John, let me just throw this in real quick. This isn't your view, as you just said, but on page uh, 37, it said, uh, the seer of Patmos, which I assume is the author of Revelation, might even be, yeah. quote, a third and separate Johannine figure. So it might even be is in the sense that you're probably citing from other scholars uh, not your not your own view okay yeah i'm gonna have to look up i'm gonna have to look up because I, I don't remember saying that but um like you say might have been <laughs> might have been a different someone else i did tend to like when referring to john you know in the context of the authorship of revelation i would refer to him as john the seer but i wasn't meant to that was just to keep everything yeah. kind of clear cool. But I do appreciate your comments. I, I think, you know, some I, I read on, um, there was a blog um, where uh, the guy mentioned, um, uh, try a blog, I think it's called, uh, that even though he didn't agree with everything, he, he found, he he learned a lot. So, you know, that to me is a, is a success if people are, awesome. you know, I think <laughs> even if you don't agree, hopefully, you know, uh, you picked up some things. Okay, um, so this is going to bring us to our last question, which you uh, you just kind of brought up in passing, Dean. And this is, and I know we've got other questions, guys. I'm not going to get to them for time's sake. I promised my wife I would get to the store and pick something up for. Uh, but this is from Don David Sternman as well, and that relates to the sons of Zebedee. He says, how does James reconcile that Jesus uh, told the sons of Zebedee that he would drink of the same cup being martyrdom? So, James, what's your take on that? Uh, this was an excellent point from uh, Dean's book. He basically argues that, um, if memory serves, it's in uh, uh, Mark chapter 9 or 10, where uh, the, well, it's in Matthew and Mark, uh, where it says that, uh, are you able to drink the cup that I drank and be baptized with the baptism that I am yeah. baptized with? And um, Sean McDowell... Through. His book on the uh, uh, fate of the apostles also points out that this seems to be a um, implying that it's going to be a martyrdom, and so I don't know. I am going to have to think about that more. I, I've I've never really thought about it, and did um, in uh, Dean's work and found it very persuasive, and uh, of course in John McDowell's work. Um, so I'll have to think about that more. I I wish I had. Yeah. something better to share but it seems it seems from the texts in mark and in Matthew that it implies that those are um, uh, martyrdom texts yeah traditions. yeah um and and i'll get your take on it too dean and then close it out but um one thing that i i was just looking at this last week and it didn't really have anything to do with preparation for our conversation or anything it's just something i was thinking about um but the way that i took that was that it's it's sort of an immersion into suffering that he's asking those disciples, are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I will be, that I'll, that'll that take place with me soon? And it's referring to the crucifixion. And, and I don't think, I think it was more of a rhetorical, in my own personal take, a rhetorical question, like, no, you can't. This is not something that you're able to do. Um, so I'm not sure how that would relate to the timing of the writing of, book, of the book of Revelation being written and the timing of their martyrdom to affect the, the date of the book of Revelation. 
Um, but anyways, that was that's kind of my take on it, just kind of carrying conversation on with you. But Dean, what would your take be? And then we'll wrap it up and go from there. Yeah, I mean, strictly speaking, it doesn't settle the matter because, uh, you know, you could hold that John, you know, wrote Revelation late, that he went back to Ephesus and then was martyred. And in fact, that is um, in one of the authors who preserves Papias's passage. That, that's how he reconciles it um, in, a, in a medieval manuscript. But, um, you know, I would, you know, it seems to me that it wasn't until the two Johns started to become identified that you have these efforts of reinterpreting it. But, you know, I, I quote other stuff like Jesus said, you know, uh, take this cup from me. You know, it's obviously referring to death. And, um, uh, you know, I have a baptism to undergo again, obviously referring to death. And Jesus did say to them, you will indeed uh, drink my cup and, uh, you know, be baptized with a baptism I'm going to be baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. So, um, uh, where was I going with this? I can't remember. But um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you know, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily affect the date. But but I do think it's only as the two become become identified uh, that you start to see reinterpretations of that as just a prophecy of suffering. Of course, James was uh, martyred. Uh, physically yeah awesome well i gotta say guys you're two hours and 54 minutes into a live stream debate so um it's been good it's been real you guys have brought up some really good points on both sides i have learned a lot from both sides and uh one guy brought up to me a question um before i when i posted this saying that, hey we're gonna do a debate on on the date of the book of revelation tomorrow uh, he replied and said, why does it matter? Why do you give the time of day for anyone who takes an early day? They're, they're heretical preterists. And the, my response was uh, kind of the same response that both you, Dean, and James have brought up today, that um, that it really doesn't matter um, uh, what it, someone's theological presupposition may be if truth leads you to that direction. And, I, and that tip, it kind of in a roundabout way is my position. If it was written early, I want to know that it was written early. If it was written late, I, I would want to know that it's written late and have all the evidence out on the table and be able to make a reasonable and justified uh, conclusion on whether it was early or late. And that's why I do hold to a late view uh, for a lot of reasons. I, I um, Without going into <laughs> too much of a monologue here, um, I, I do appreciate you guys coming on to have this conversation for being able to work it out and making it so easy. So, Dean, James, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, so much, Josh. Yeah. Thanks, guys. We'll yeah, talk to you, you soon. Too, All right. Hey, take care. Thank that, you. That'll work. Hey, audience, thank you for tuning in again to another episode of Talking Christianity Apologetics. My name is Josh Gibbs, and uh, today you've been able to kind of witness a debate um, with recent scholarship, Dean Furlong, um, dealing with an early date, a support for an early date, and then James. James Rockford, go check his his website out as well, Evidence Unseen, and DeanFurlong.com. So um, those those two guys have put a lot of work into um, the background information to support their positions, and I think they interacted very well. I think they were really honest with some things that is like, hey, I don't really have a great answer for that right now, um, but it seems like a, a good argument to make. Um, but anyways, guys, I, I appreciate you tuning in. Feel free to like, share, subscribe, and uh get this get this video out to those who you think might find it important so anyways god bless you guys have a good evening